I would just like to extend a warm welcome and, and uh, my sincere thanks to all of you for being us within in this panel. Uh, I will now request Varvi to start by perhaps introducing the panelists first, and then uh, Professor Chatterjee can take it forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to first uh, introduce Professor Chatterjee. Uh, Professor Ashok Chatterjee has received his education at Woodstock School, Missouri, uh, St. Stephen's College, and uh, Miami University, Ohio. Uh, he has a background in engineering industry, international civil service, Indian Tourism Development Corporation, and 25 years in the service of National Institute of Design, Ahmedabad, where he was the executive director, senior faculty, distinguished fellow, and professor of communication and management. He was also the honorary president of Crafts Council of India for over 20 years and continues to serve uh, CCI. He is also the advisor to the, the Center for Heritage Management. Uh, we have then uh, Mr. Ashish Kothari, who is the founder of Kalpavriksh, a 40-year-old civil society organization in India that focuses on environment and development issues. He has taught in Indian Institute of Public Administration uh, as a professor of practice at National Law School uh, and University ba Bangalore, and a guest faculty in several other universities in India and abroad. He has also coordinated India's National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan, served on Indian government committees to formulate the National Biodiversity Act and National Wildlife Action Plan, and served on boards or steering communities of two IUCN commissions, Greenpeace International and India and the ICCA Consortium. So he has a long, uh, uh, a lot of years of experience in uh, social development and environmental issues. And we also have Dr. Marilina Ali Vizatu, uh, who holds a PhD in Cultural Heritage and Museum Studies from University College London. She is an honorary lecturer at UCL Institute of Archaeology and has a long standing interest in intangible heritage as conceptual and operational framework in heritage theory and policy, which has led to two monographs, Intangible uh, Heritage and Participation, Encounters with Safeguarding Practices, and in Intangible Heritage and the Museum, New Perspectives on Cultural Preservation and other uh, publications. Um, I'm sure you must have heard uh, Professor Marilina at the ICH World Forum as well. And finally, we have Juliet Hopkins, who is not here, but we have her recording. Uh, Juliet Hopkins is an Associate Program Specialist in the Secretariat for UNESCO's 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of ICH. She is currently working in the Program Management Unit, where she is the Regional Officer for Southern and Eastern Africa. She is also the focal point for issues relating to ICH and emergencies and has been part of UNESCO's efforts to document the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on living heritages. And that is how we bring them all together for this panel discussion of ICH and the COVID-19 pandemic. So Ashok sir, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I have been able to uh, keep in touch with your discussions over these past few days, intangible heritage or tangible heritage, but culture as a force and as a support in such uncertain times is certainly something that many of us have realized in extraordinary ways during this, these past almost two years. The real issue to my mind has been that the pandemic has perhaps brought into the center a concern that we've all had, which is that matters of culture are seen as uh, two issues of development and survival of the planet rather than at the center. I'm not sure what the experience of all of you has been, but certainly as someone who works in the craft sector, this has been a huge issue for us over, over many years. Whenever priorities are, are, are concerned, somehow culture comes, slips right down to the bottom. And we are considered as perhaps uh, what might be described as a soft investment 
not as a critical investment. However, the pandemic seems to be changing that, largely because so many sections of society have had to depend that we've never experienced before. It has also forced us to look for strengths uh, outside the more normal uh, support systems that the economy provides us. And here again, the creative and cultural industries have come into their own. So the issue to my mind for an opportunity like this is to ask ourselves that having gone through this very difficult period, what, are, what lessons or what experiences have emerged that we can hang on to and ensure that in the coming years, policies change and priorities change. How can we do that? We had hoped that the sustainable development goals would be a major opportunity for that. And they are, they still are. And why is that? Because through the sustainable development goals for the first time, the international community has mm -hmm. accepted, at least on paper, that the true measure of progress is human well-being, not statistics, not infrastructure, but the well-being that should that that infrastructure and statistics should actually be serving. This is a major change, and whether we've all understood it or not is a matter for discussion. But certainly, I can I feel in my own experience over these past months that for the first time people have started to listen as to why those of us who are in the sector of culture that we have something to offer that is not a choice but is a priority and i think that this might be a good way to ask ourselves as we start this discussion that what have we learned that can influence policy at local levels, particularly at local levels, where communities are. I'll give you one example. The pandemic has created an absolute disaster for migrant communities in our country. And we have discovered that so many of our urban centers are basically dependent on migrant communities live a deprived life. When the pandemic hit, millions of these migrants were on the streets and on the roads of India, going back to their villages in search for some kind of stability, for some kind of humanity, and for some kind of caring, which for them meant going home. Now the question is, what happens to these communities? If the pandemic has us, bring urban societies, or is it possible for them to find opportunities of livelihood and of decent living in their own localities where they are located? And for that, what opportunities do they have? The farm economy can take only so many. So what about non-farm survival opportunities? And non-farm survival opportunities brings our sector of culture right into the center of concern. So I would suggest that perhaps we could start with some sense of whether we are, learning any lessons that we can now take as documented experiences to the level of policy making in our societies. We change at the local community level. 
where people are, using our cultural resources as a source for progress, for well-being, and not and not just for survival, but survival at a decent level. So I suggest we open perhaps with that consideration and ask whether this experience resonates at all with what you are experiencing and what you have felt over these past months. Thank you. Thank you very much for introducing those key issues, uh, which I have noted here in terms of moving from the idea of a soft investment to something more meaningful, addressing issues of human well-being, but at the same time influencing policy. I come to this discussion from the perspective of the academic researcher who has lived in a very specific you know, academic context of London, but at the same time have tried to kind of embed this research in the work of local communities, organizations, museums, small museums, different levels of uh, heritage action and activism. And it is those kinds of bottom-up approaches that fascinate me and have driven me all these kind of years to research in different contexts. And for me, you know, I wouldn't want to go into a personal kind of uh, living of the pandemic, but it has really brought to the fore uh, what you have just mentioned, that instantly, you know, the idea of social cohesion and uh, cultural well-being, all of these uh, important parts of being human suddenly fell apart. And, you know, the idea of isolation and being, uh, you know, separated from, uh, you know, people, communities uh, around us uh, was felt uh, very significantly. Um, the report of UNESCO, however, has shown, and I think this is one of the ideas that I have tried to put forward, and, uh, the idea of adaptability and kind of opportunities emerging in this context. The point for today's panel discussion is to discuss the impact and the opportunities at the same time of the pandemic and to rethink uh, and, in this sense, repurpose intangible heritage and this idea of repurposing is the thing that I will be coming back to you know throughout kind of this this introduction uh, just to say before before you know especially talking about the pandemic give my congratulations and uh, kudos to the organizers to all the this initiative of bringing together participants people from around the world having similar concerns interests, uh, work uh, careers in the field of heritage, uh, action, work, preservation, whatever the angles and perspectives from which you come. Uh, so it's been uh, fascinating to follow some of these discussions. And thank you, Barbie, for sending the pre-recorded sessions and see the, the way uh, people from around the world address those issues, something that it might appear a universal concern, may have different uh, local uh, interpretations and negotiations in different parts of the world. And I have followed some of those uh, uh, tensions within, within those discussions. So I would like first to summarize a bit some of the themes that I, I have kind of picked up during this workshop and through the sessions that I have uh, noticed, and then introduce a bit the, um, my talk from the World Heritage Convention. So the first point that emerged for me was uh, Miss Han Bing Duong's from uh, UNESCO Bangkok uh, discussion of how we have moved from the idea of intangible heritage preservation per se to the broader field of use or uh, supporting how can intangible heritage support sustainable development, but also how can sustainable development support the safeguarding of intangible heritage. And within this context then, intangible heritage is being rethought from the field of heritage preservation, kind of the approach that UNESCO has developed over the past uh, kind of 20 years to something rooted and embedded in more bigger issues around social, environmental uh, and cultural development. You've gone through all that, but the important thing for me here is that intangible heritage becomes a tool, a resource. I, I keep that, and in this sense, the idea that emerged uh, strongly was in Hyatt's presentation and how um, we're thinking then in terms of sustainable economic development, the idea of local stewardship in a local market and the idea of community empowerment. We talked about how uh, themes of uh, marketing Western economy through 
harnessing the potential of social media and using then uh, marketing techniques with charging appropriate prices, again, creates this uh, idea of intangible heritage as a, a product. Uh, so my question there was, were there any concerns related to this regarding the problematic implications of introducing those kind of Western economic development models in very different local situations? Uh, the next interesting point that emerged was all that discussion around gender equality and gender equality and the empowerment of women, um, girls and gender minorities, how this is one of the sustainable development goals. The contradiction there between sometimes perhaps reinforcing or heritage validating gender stereotypes and norms at the same time as empowerment. Uh, emerged a lot, I think, from that conversation you had towards the end, uh, but also the idea of preserving and at the same time renewing gender roles. Uh, and of course, thinking again of the huge role uh, and the impact of the pandemic on um, marginalized and minority groups, such as uh, women, girls, and gender minorities. Uh, I was thinking here in terms of the rise of uh, domestic violence, for example, which has been recorded in, in, in cases in Europe and uh, direct attacks uh, uh, on women. And UNESCO's then report, which I think we will go over, but introduces the idea of, uh, you know, projects to build back better uh, by harnessing digital technologies. And I know we will hear more from that. So I just quickly go into the question that was raised for me. Uh, to address and I have explored in terms of, uh, you know, different uh, that European research project uh, with Yanis as well several years ago now, but it gave us that uh, taste of the, the power of uh, digi the digital tools uh, with several, of course, uh, concerns and issues that we, ha we have raised and have been raising. So how can new technologies contribute to the safeguarding and transmission of intangible heritage? That was the question that was uh, posed to us even before the pandemic, uh, no, quite before the pandemic. So um, my intervention in the, world, were in, the, in the World Intangible Heritage Forum was trying to think uh, in terms of the, uh, the creative potential of uh, intangible heritage uh, in these kind of situations. And by choosing the title uh, repurposing, I was trying to make this call to overcome safeguarding anxiety, which has characterized UNESCO discussions, thinking about the focus on authenticity or making lists, which was a, a main focus of the work of UNESCO, especially in the first uh, de decade of the development of the convention. And then thinking in terms of the creative interplay between change, transformation, and impermanence, and how this by itself is a heritage value, because it allows for uh, these cultural traditions to maintain a sense of reality and connection with, uh, with people on the ground. Um, I won't go, but you know, this idea of impermanence is a, a theoretical framework that characterizes, I think, Buddhist philosophy as well, Japanese philosophy, and is rooted in ancient Greece. So this idea of everything changes, you can't keep culture contained in a, in a box or in a library or museum. And, and I think here is where it gets a bit more kind of detailed with uh, some examples, which I won't discuss now, but I think, I mean, I can, but I think that misses the point of the quick introduction. Um, that I talked about. And uh, so thinking about in terms of these specific projects, one of which was the EU funded project, which looked at how can we create learning resources, uh, employing different platforms and digital tools on the one hand, capturing uh, again, and on the other hand, transmitting and converting all this data into a format that can be used by schools, primary schools, university schools, uh, art schools uh, in, in different activities with the problematic assumptions uh, and so on. The second project was the Art Pluriverse and uh, I wanted to relate it to um, Mr. Kotharis as well work in press and how this is a work that has affected 
academic researchers all over the world. And that case of Greece was very characteristic. And I thought, look, there is this international dialogue which goes beyond uh, thinking about a, an economic kind of model that has come from the established can canon, uh, but the idea of pluriverse, different worlds coexisting, uh, you know, around the world. So I thought that uh, that idea of sharing there for all that knowledge and the relation with the creative commons. And the third point I was making was around um, that that other platform, the Palestine Open Maps, combining again digital mapping and oral history in a kind of creative methodology of using intangible heritage as a tool for social action. And I think that we may kind of, you know, discussing the different di the dimensions and parameters of sustainable development, but uh, I think the focus should always be on justice, social action, and of course, uh, empowerment. So uh, the degrees to this, all these kind of tensions coexist, I think em emerges even more uh, when we talk about uh, sustainable development. The final point, and again, I think this is to be discussed later on uh, around participation uh, is also the idea of having some universal framework of this is how we do heritage, but at the same time respecting cultural difference and finding those habits of coexistence, uh, which is kind of the last point around ethics. And of course, here I won't be giving the lecture, but I would like all of us to kind of uh, share and take part in this dialogue. So even less than 10 minutes to, to introduce the, the key points I was trying to make. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, very much looking forward to hearing from you. And uh, as I said, uh, the whole impact of uh, the pandemic and around those issues makes, you know, forces as the pandemic has forced us to rethink about how, what is the role for intangible heritage for the practitioners, but the whole network uh, of people that are uh, concerned and involved uh, when we take something and make it into heritage, so, and call it heritage. So uh, a, a short introduction, I hope I make sense. <laughs> And now as it gets uh, later in the morning, I will, uh, I will be a bit more <laughs> sensible with what I say. Thank you very much, uh, Marilena. That's very interesting concepts you have uh, shared with us. There was a slight uh, break in transmission, so I missed a few of your points, but I hope I can catch up on that. I'm rather intrigued by <clears throat> this reference you've just made to the need for developing habits of coexistence, which then suggests to us the critical importance of heritage in terms of peace and security for communities. And perhaps at that uh, level, we could ask um, Ashish Kothari to share his thoughts with us. Worked so much at the level of communities and <clears throat> conflict resolution. Ashish. Thank you, Ashokji. Thanks uh, to the Center for Heritage Management. It's always a pleasure to talk to the center people. So thanks for this. Um, I will, and uh, thanks to uh, Marilena, because I think what you've said uh, is not just very interesting, but gives me a very strong foundation to sort of build on and add some perspectives. So uh, like you, partly because it's very cold here, I will rely not just on my oral strengths, but also on slides. I can share the screen. Uh, can this be seen? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, yeah, I'll also try and take about 10 minutes uh, for this opening brief um, and basically talk about uh, elements of uh, intangible heritage, and I'm going to expand the uh, definition as I usually do to include some uh, political and other aspects also, um, and see how communities have actually been resilient in COVID times, even as we see uh, some governments or many governments and many 
corporations using this last one and a half, two years as an opportunity to become more authoritarian, more profit making, uh, increase inequalities in the world, increase ecological destruction, etc. We also see the counter trends of communities, people, some sometimes governments also trying to search for alternatives which don't lead us down the same pathways that we were in uh, before COVID. Uh, and it's this second part of it, the, the expressions of solidarity, et cetera, which I want to focus on more. I'm going to give three or four examples of uh, some that, I, that I'm familiar with just to illustrate what I'm talking about. This is uh, most of the Indians on this uh, session will be familiar with this. Uh, this is a group of uh, about 5,000 Dalit women farmers. Dalits are the most oppressed section of India's uh, caste system, so-called untouchables. Um, and as women, of course, they're also oppressed in, in a patriarchal society, and they're also all very small farmers. Now, in the last 25 to 30 years, these women, about 5,000 of them, have collectively moved towards not just complete food security from a situation of hunger, malnutrition, etc., to uh, food security, but also food sovereignty uh, by asserting their complete rights to and control over everything to do with food, the land, the seeds, the knowledge, the water, etc. Uh, and this through a lot of sharing of knowledge, of ideas, of innovations, constant, uh, I, I'm glad, for instance, Marilena spoke about impermanence, uh, the constant innovations and changes that take place also in, in the heritage. It's not stuck in one, one, one place. Uh, and many other things I could go on for a half an hour uh, on just this example, but just wanted to say this. And also that during the COVID pandemic, because of the kind of base that they had built over these last 25 years, not just in these 75 villages where the women completely secure with food and lo local livelihoods, but also that they were contributing to the food relief measures of the district. Uh, by providing food from their from their farms, uh, which incidentally are also completely organic, all local seeds, etc. A second example is from Central India. This is indigenous uh, people, Adivasis, uh, who have claimed uh, complete control over their forest surroundings, reversing 200 years of colonial and post-colonial centralized uh, government control over forests. And through that, they have actually generated community funds by, by ha sustainably harvesting the forests, which in fact became very, very important during the COVID pandemic when a lot of migrant labor had to come back to the villages, the issue that um, Ashokji uh, raised. Uh, they uh, used those community funds to be able to help to tide over the period in which these people really had no livelihood options, in fact, very little food also. And one of their most important points in these 90 villages is that democracy is not about elections. It's about us claiming power where we are. And to me, that's a very important part also of intangible heritage, the, the ability to be able to self-govern and take decisions for oneself. Third example is from Kutch in Western India. This is a very interesting village, which uh, immediately imposed lockdown even before the Indian government did, but they did it very differently. They put in all the safety measures in March, February, March 2020, but they also sustained all their economic activities. They made sure that people, for instance, who were dependent on the uh, National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme were continued to get uh, the, their wage, daily wages and other economic activities continued. Uh, completely unlike what happened nationally, where a sudden economic lockdown was imposed, creating problems for tens of millions of uh, workers. Uh, they also did a lot of very interesting work on digital uh, forms of education when physically the schools were not possible. A lot more games, a lot more possibilities of learning within the community from elders, etc. Uh, we have documented about 65 such stories from different parts of India in five volumes. I will put the link, put the link to, to these. these. There's an echo. Ashokji, I think you have two devices open, so there's some echo coming. Okay. Uh, can you hear me again? Yes, we can hear you. 
Okay. Yeah. So I'll put the link on uh, where you can download these stories and we're coming up with many more from different parts of India, different kinds of communities, women, farmers, youth, uh, people in the Himalayas, etc. Now, all of this uh, kind of builds on uh, some documentation we've been doing of stories of well-being, which go, uh, which are very different from the normal, uh, you know, what is called development and actually to some extent also sustainable development. These, these are challenging even the fundamentals of what is development and saying we, are, we want to do things differently. Um, now, what are the sort of key lessons from the stories of COVID resilience uh, in India? Uh, very quickly, one, community spirit. The importance of actually rebuilding a sense of solidarity within the community or between communities, which has taken a big hit in the process of economic commercialization, modernization, capitalism, etc. But that also then includes challenging internal inequalities because communities also have their own uh, issues and problems with regard to patriarchy, casteism, etc. Secondly, collective rights to the commons, uh, which again has been very problematic with the modern development process of privatization and uh, handing over to corporations, etc. The reclaiming of those collective rights to forest commons, water commons, knowledge commons, etc. Third, uh, direct democracy, like I already mentioned, what Gandhi called Swaraj, which is that I and we as a community will claim complete freedom. But even as we do that, we do it in responsibility with your freedom and your well-being. So it's not uh, the American way of freedom that we, uh, we see destroying the world. Um, fourth, localized self-reliance, rather than these globalized uh, chains of uh, production and consumption, to actually say that at least for basic needs, and that includes not just water, food, et cetera, but also um, education and health, that we should be in control in, in, our, in our community or collective of communities uh, and dignified livelihoods based on localized exchange, which are not prone to collapse when something like COVID hits. Fifth, uh, knowledge traditions, but also hybrids of knowledge. And this again relates to the changes that take place, which Marilina also spoke about. So many of these examples are where they've asserted their own local traditional knowledge, but also absorbed things from outside, which they feel are appropriate for the current situation. Uh, sixth, cultural diversity. India has about 800 living languages. Each of them is a, is a repository of knowledge. And when we have educational systems that teach in only about 20 main so-called state languages, we're actually erasing entire libraries of knowledge. So the assertion of cultural diversity, which includes language, customs, foods, arts, many other things, of course, you're all familiar with this, uh, is part of these, this transformation. And finally, reintegrating ourselves within nature and re being responsible towards the rest of nature, because it's not a world that is meant only for human beings. And that brings me to... Uh, um, the, the whole issue of ethics. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to this slide in a minute, but one of the important things that we learn from these examples is that they're based on a set of, a core set of, of uh, values and principles, which are very different from what the dominant system tells us. So for instance, uh, I spoke about uh, cooperation, collectivity, solidarity, common conviviality, which is completely different from the individualistic selfishness that the modern society is telling us. We, we ask for rights, but we also say responsibility towards others, the dignity of labor, um, many other things. I obviously don't have the time to go into all of this, but essentially worldviews that celebrate life, not that celebrate money and fame and power, but life as a whole. Um, just quickly to go back to that one slide and then I'll end. Um, so what we see in these different uh, initiatives is sort of a, we call this a flower of transformation. Uh, a more sort of attempt at a more holistic vision of what society could look like, where politics, economics, society, culture, and environment kind of integrate as, as a whole, and you see transformations taking place, or would like to see transformations taking place in all of these, with that core set of values as at the, at the center of this. One of the processes that we've been doing in India to try and expand this is the Vikalp Sangam, which is the Alternatives Confluence, bringing a lot of these groups and movements and individuals together to learn from each other, create more of a 
critical mass. There's a website, uh, I'll put that in the link later, which has about 1800 stories of this kind of uh, positive transformation. And uh, responding to one of Ashokji's uh, points, we started a few months back a national network or a platform called Vikalp Sutra, which is to try and exchange information and build a, a cross learning on dignified livelihood. So where, for instance, migrant workers have gone back to their villages to try and see, and if they don't want to come back uh, to their, their insecure lives in cities and industrial areas, what options do they have? What can they learn from other places where successful initiatives have taken place? Um, that's the book Pluriverse, which has examples of this kind from all over the world. Obviously, I, I am at this stage not going to go into this in any detail, uh, but uh, just one quick example, which is similar to the one of the Dalit women farmers from uh, Peru of Quechua indigenous people who, having claimed complete biocultural rights to their landscape, which includes the origin of a potato, um, they were also extremely resilient in the COVID period and were in fact contributing to relief in nearby Cusco town. Um, so to, to enable much more cross-learning across the world, we have also uh, recently initiated this uh, platform called the Global Tapestry, which is documenting many, many, many stories of not just COVID time, but also resilience in the face of other global crises. And since Marilena mentioned Palestine, uh, it's a happy coincidence. We had just a couple of months back a very interesting presentation from a local cultural and art center which kept uh, youth enthusiasm and hope going even during the entire COVID period and in the midst of, of course, the uh, Israeli aggression. Thanks. Um, I hope uh, not gone on too long, but uh, those are some opening thoughts. Thank you, uh, Ashokji, back to you. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Okay. My name is you? Juliet Hopkins and I'm an Associate Program Specialist with the UNESCO Living Heritage Entity. And it's my pleasure to be here today presenting to you on the results of the UNESCO survey on living heritage and the pandemic. Um, firstly, apologies also that I was not able to join live in the discussion today, so I've recorded my presentation. And I'd also like to thank the organisers um, for including us in today's session on ICH and the pandemic. I hope that um, the workshop has been going well so far and it's been very productive and enriching, which I've tuned into some sessions and they looked very um, rich. So I'm glad to be participating today. So I'll share now with you my screen for the presentation. Here we are. So today I'm going to be presenting, um, as I mentioned, the results of an online survey, and I'm going to structure the presentation by starting to look at three themes, one around impact, then around adaptation, and thirdly around resilience. And then I'm going to link this to the recommendations that came out of the report and the follow-up activities that UNESCO is doing um, in this area. So if we go to the next slide... Um, so what did this survey set out to do? So its main aim was to enhance learning and understanding about safeguarding living heritage in the context of the pandemic. We structured it around one open-ended question, looking at these two dual roles of ICH in the pandemic, which is one, around how ICH has been affected, and the second, around how um, ICH has played a role in the lives of communities to support resilience and recovery. Um, so we published the survey on our website and in order to share the results, we created this open access online platform. And this was really designed as a space where communities could share their experiences um, in exchange with others. And I've got the link to the platform on screen there. So I encourage you to take a look. It's on our website in the section on intangible cultural heritage and emergency situations. To give you an idea, overview of the results that we received. So we received over 200 responses from 78 countries. As you can see, 59% of those responses were from bearers and communities, which is a great result because they were really the target audience for the survey. And it really underlines the community-based nature of ICH safeguarding. Then the graph on the right shows um, the breakdown of responses by geographic region. So you can see that the majority, the most responses we had came from Latin America and the Caribbean, 
closely followed by Western Europe and North America and then Asia and the Pacific. Um, and the responses have all been indexed according to different themes. We did a qualitative analysis to classify different themes and they can also be searched according to language, region, country, actor. So I really encourage you to explore this platform in more detail for your particular interests. So starting off with the first kind of area of inquiry that we were looking at, which was how ICH has been impacted by the pandemic. And it's difficult when looking at impact because you, there's complex processes of transmission um, that characterise ICH safeguarding. So the true impact of the pandemic probably won't be seen for, is likely to play out in the years to come. But um, in the immediate um, term, I'm sure we can all agree that we saw how physical distancing and lockdown measures immediately went to the heart of many intangible cultural heritage practices, which depend on human to human interaction for their very kind of expression and viability. So we saw access to cultural and natural spaces restricted, performance spaces closed, limited access to raw materials and markets, the cancellation of festive events and the disruption of everyday social rituals and practices around life cycle events. So not only did this cause a profound impact on the social, cultural and spiritual lives of communities, but what came out very strongly in the survey was also the economic impact that they had on the lives of communities, and especially those that depend on ICH for their livelihood, which goes back to this theme of this interaction between intangible cultural heritage safeguarding, sustainable development and economic inclusive economic development, which... Um, I think has been touched upon earlier in the workshop. But of course, as we know, um, intangible cultural heritage is dynamic. Sorry, I just slipped this slide. Intangible cultural heritage is dynamic and adaptive. Um, and so while some practices may have been threatened by the lockdown measures, we saw also some practices that were tr transformed and actually started to have new meaning. Um, specifically in this context, uh, we saw a proliferation of online means to share and transmit intangible cultural heritage with the use of social media and different platforms. Um, digital technologies, of course, open up many new opportunities for ICH safeguarding, which is a very interesting area to look at. Um, but it also raises questions about how this development can take place in an ethical and equi equitable way. Um, we also saw instances of certain rituals and practices being reinterpreted and to gain new meaning in the context of the pandemic. And also this more time that we had spent at home actually increased opportunities for intergenerational transmission. And we received quite a few responses from younger generations talking about how they were re-engaging with their living heritage from um, their grandparents or their parents while spending more time in the home with them. Um, and this brings us to, you know, why, how people are turning to ICH in this context and what role um, ICH was playing in their lives. And a lot of people spoke about um, at the individual level how practising and enjoying their ICH actually brought psychological and spiritual comfort in the context of the pandemic. For instance, we saw many people turn to traditional belief systems and music and song or traditional foods cooked at home to bring them this sense of support and comfort. Um, at the collective level, we also saw groups coming together um, to perhaps share traditional dances or songs to use ICH here as a channel of social support, solidarity and cohesion, um, as some of the images in this slide um, display. So while some of these kind of values around social cohesion, solidarity are not so quantifiable and are quite qualitative in nature, what they do reinforce is the continued value of ICH um, in the lives of communities during the pandemic. And it reminds us also that public health is not just about preventing the transmission of disease, but also about enhancing people's quality of life. And in this way, we can see how intangible cultural heritage had an important therapeutic and uh, restorative dimension in the pandemic. Another key theme that came out was the role of living heritage and how it was used to communicate about COVID-19 and promote behaviour change and advocate for public health recommendations. 
I've included two videos here in this PowerPoint. The first one is from Cambodia, where it's um, Taipei masters who use the traditional oral form to convey public health information. There's another example here of um, traditional string puppet theatre in Sri Lanka and how it was used to transform to educate the public about responsible behaviour around COVID. So this shows how ICH was used to um, share information in more accessible and relatable ways for communities. And then a third major theme that came out was these links to or a revival in certain types of um, local forms of food production, agriculture and healthcare, as well as traditional crafts, which were used as an alternative source of income in this context. And I think this shows how the pandemic also stimulated um, this thinking or shift in the way we live and um, how ICH may play a role in this context to find more sustainable and resilient solutions to sustainable agricultural and other questions. So based on the findings of the report, um, three general recommendations or guiding recommendations were put forward to orientate the actions of government, civil society, the private sector and bearers towards ICH safeguarding in the pandemic. The first um, was around strengthening direct support mechanisms to living heritage bearers. And uh, these need to be enacted as much as possible at the local level, including through local governance structures for building back better. The second way was in leveraging opportunities offered by digital technologies to support resilience and safeguarding and to increase the visibility and recognition of living heritage. Um, for instance, we saw the creation of online public spaces or enhanced networking, online networking events or um, communications campaigns around intangible cultural heritage. And thirdly was the need to intensify efforts to integrate living heritage into emergency preparedness response and recovery plans in general, which is about enhancing information sharing um, with these actors um, working in the humanitarian and emergency preparedness and response fields. So based on these three guiding recommendations, we actually worked closely with some of our field officers to develop some pilot projects um, to support recovery in this context. I've provided some examples here of the projects that are currently ongoing, um, and they can all be found on our website. The link is there, but we can see some of these themes coming out around um, the digitization of ICH, enhancing its visibility, the role of youth, and also activities to support um, local crafts. So these projects have just been launched, but we will be sharing the results of them um, as they develop in the coming months. So that brings me to the conclusion of the presentation. Um, I've tried to just give you an overview today of some of the main findings and recommendations from the report, but I really encourage you to go back and um, have a look at the report in more detail and also the online platform to pick out some examples um, that communities have highlighted in their responses. Um, and I hope that some of these can provide some food for thought um, for the discussions today. Again, I'm sorry that I can't be there. Um, but if you do have any questions, please send them through um, to the organisers and I would be happy to stay in touch by email. So thank you very much and wishing you all the best for the remainder of the session. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation. One of the things that seems to have come through from the discussions and presentations we've had so far is the overwhelming importance of locality and of community toward the... Uh, <clears throat> whatever next steps we take. Uh, Marlena had talked about local stewardship and empowering that. Ashish's presentation has brought out the critical importance of communities as the key to sustained well-being. And Juliet Hopkins has repeatedly brought out again the importance of working at the local level and at the community level, and indeed of seeing uh, cultural heritage within the context of disaster management, which 
appears to be a context that we will have to learn to live with. The pandemic possibly, therefore, is the an introduction to uh, a disturbing pattern that may be with us, with climate change and the other upheavals that are all around us. Uh, within all of these, we are constantly hearing about the importance of technology. And here I question that I might want to raise is that can communities have larger control over the technologies that they will need in order to ensure that local action can make the kind of difference that uh, the speakers have talked about. Uh, in Ashish's presentation, there was a reference to a community which emphasized that we are the government. In other words, uh, <clears throat> where we are located, that is where the action should be. And yet we are also seeing that the pandemic uh, has also led to centralization of power and authority at the other end. So how are we going to manage this tension? Our speakers have been telling us that the, the way forward depends so heavily on local empowerment, on shifting power to communities and particularly to women in those communities. And yet, both technology as well as resources continue to be concentrated at, at the top rather than at the bottom. And we are facing this constantly in the work that we do. And the excuse is often that emergency response requires centralized direction and control and authority. So how do we balance these? Uh, <clears throat> perhaps we could, we could take that up in our discussion. Uh, on my screen, I don't see the next speaker. So I'm just going to get asked for some help from Neil on this as to who is now with us at uh, Professor Poulos, is he? No, I think uh, this will be the panel, three of you, because Juliet okay. is not right. here. And uh, yeah, Han was uh, trying to be here, but she also had some other again. So yes, I saw her, but then her. she's gone from my yeah. screen. But uh, technology is playing tricks here. So, uh, Mar Marilena, how do you see this issue of the power structure that we seem to want and the manner in which power is today distributed? What can cultural heritage do toward a more equal uh, and inclusive system for the future? Would you like to comment on that? Yes, and thank you. This is a very thought-provoking question, and I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, Ashish's presentation and kind of the details that emerged through uh, Juliette's presentation. The, the pandemic, ultimately, I think, has this is about young people, younger generations, how they see their place in the world, and increasingly you have the sense of dissatisfaction environmental, social injustice, problems, uh, you know, emerging. And of course, we have heard a lot about work at a community level, particularly in uh, rural settings. There are huge urban tensions and upheavals, which we haven't touched upon, like intangible heritage is something happening a bit further away. But young people, uh, you see all these protests now in Europe, young people are revolting, the system is not working. And for many people, in you know, the past, whatever that represents, whether taking up a, a sustained agriculture uh, or uh, knitting your own clothes or recycling, there is a, a huge change happening at the moment. Uh, intangible heritage in this sphere is part of that, you know, we move forward by looking back. This is a conversation I had with the, some Maori researchers and activists in New Zealand to, while I was doing my research. We can't forget you know, our past and the past is a, a home, something safe, connected with who we are, but also something that we want to pass on and transmit to the future. So this dissatisfaction with the current political system and the way you know, things are run in terms of, uh, you know, capitalist economies or bureaucracies that are particularly strong and you feel you're voiceless. These are challenged, uh, at least, uh, you know, in, in the world that I'm more familiar with. But I think 
there is a sense of kind of change and we, we, we have to change the world. Uh, the, the question that I was thinking, uh, I was so impressed with all the initiatives and activist work uh, uh, in India, and I think there are cases in Peru around the world. How are these voices uh, embraced at, you know, at the political system of government? Is this, uh, are we, uh, you know, the, the green people uh, the, that kind of want to change the world, but no one takes seriously? Are the companies kind of, you know, the multinationals ruling everything and then culture is like the cherry to make it look nice? Or can we make, bring change? Um, Arilina, let me ask you one question. You talk about how <clears throat> communities look to the past for their security and well-being in a time like this. But in the presentations that we've had, including what Ashish has shared with us, there is also a lot about that past which is full of injustice and has to change. So the past cannot only be our security. We are looking for a path into the future which is more just and more equitable. And therefore, when we talk about cultural heritage, and particularly when we use these terms of cultural heritage, does the pandemic tell us anything about what also needs to change in that heritage? What heritage do we have to create for the next generation? And this takes us to the question of, you know, what is heritage in the sense of the positive, but also negative or dark heritage. And we're talking about histories of colonialism and post-colonial thinking and decolonial, decolonizing, uh, you know, the past. The, the, the project that I was referring to in my presentation, the Palestine Open Maps, was carried, uh, carried out by Palestinian researchers, which they took these maps uh, of the British mandate in Palestine, which they had been drawn with much detail in the 30s and 40s, digitizing those maps uh, and then superimposing latest maps of the, of the same area where the same villages had been uh, wiped out. So there was the absence, noting the absence. Now there is a forest where you know, the researchers' grandparents' village used to be, Lubia. And he was talking and uh, we're, we're still discussing that project because it's a methodology in a way for decolonizing mapping in general as a practice, especially in, and he has been talking about how he's working with around the world. With, um, you know, there are conversations in terms of this, the, the history of Cyprus and this divide and the war and how then activists and activist researchers use those, uh, you know, colonial tools and decolonize them by adding oral histories, personal testimonies, and making, marking their point in the map. Uh, so uh, again, at the community level, but overall as a methodology, uh, it's kind of not forgetting the past because you can't, uh, you know, for Palestinian people, and I speak not as a representative because I hardly, I have never been to in Palestine, but I have engaged with Palestinian researchers. The homeland is a very uh, important message. Nakba it was the, the first war and the second Nakba is the war against forgetting. So we want to keep that identity and that heritage and, and doing research with uh, in, in refugee camps, in with the migrant community, with commu Palestinian communities around the world. I have the Palestine, Palestinian friends here in London who always, you know, talk about, you know, the past is very, a very important part of who they are with the uh, personal collections and maps of, you know, a place they have never really been to. The, the communities that have grown and raised uh, uh, in, in, in Europe, away from home, but still, uh, you know, you take the past forward and you, in this sense, not only for identity and memory work, but also as a, as a political statement. Uh, so uh, every, <laughs> every case is different, but sometimes we think that intangible heritage are the, you know, and this is that something that I wrote in my book, how do, is there a negative intangible heritage, whether that is uh, connected to uh, injustice or civil wars or uh, 
more painful and traumatic parts of people's histories and how do we pass that on or sometimes we forget them because in Greece there have been civil wars and no one talks about that you know it's the complete forget you know kind of trying to take it away but um it's still so very much you important you're pointing out how important memory is to this entire process of taking strength from our heritage and moving forward uh, how do you see this, Ashish, <clears throat> in the context of communities that want power to be transferred to the local level and who themselves represent the burden of the past, not to just its strength, but also the burden? How do you see that? Yeah, thanks. Uh, no, I mean, I, I completely agree with what uh, Marilena has said also. If you, one of the examples I gave from Central India of uh, the indigenous villages claiming self governance and self determination, uh, it's a very interesting thing that even as they do that and as they uh, continue to build on their memories and heritage of the past, they also are questioning that past. So, for instance, women have been questioning, saying, uh, and mind you, this is a context uh, where, of course, those in India are familiar with it, that indigenous peoples in India are much more gender sensitive, or let's say gender e equality is greater than in the rest of India. And yet there is uh, discrimination. So for instance, women have traditionally not been part of the political decision making in the villages. And that's being questioned now as part of the movement. So there is a separate women's uh, mobilization so that they can actually have a voice in every village and in the federation of 90 villages that they have formed. Uh, youth are being, uh, you know, have their own voice. And one of the interesting things is also to try and see in the education system there, which is completely alienating otherwise, is to build in uh, Adivasi tribal heritage uh, so that the young people, of course, they're learning things from outside but they also continue to be at least to some extent rooted rooted in their own uh, cultural and ecological and political heritage uh, past. So I, I think there's lots of such interesting things, uh, a lot of churning that is taking place. And when I spoke about hybrid knowledges, this is also similar. I mean, Ashokji, you know, of course, that for instance, uh, revival of uh, handloom weaving in Kutch uh, in Western India uh, has been based on continuing the old uh, traditions, the learning from from parents and things like that, but also building, you know, new modern products, uh, using uh, mobile phones to to learn designs from elsewhere, create a market, etc. So uh, people are kind of developing this kind of uh, hybrid systems, uh, which don't completely discard the past, uh, nor you know totally accept what's coming from the modern. They kind of try and sift through these to see, okay, what is most appropriate what fits into changing value systems, et cetera. Not that all of this is successful. Sometimes it just goes completely haywire and wrong, but you know, that's how it is. Uh, I wanted also to also to respond, uh, Ashokji, to your earlier question about technology and the global forces that are behind, uh, behind technology and, and behind finance. How does one deal with that? Uh, obviously there's no easy answers there, but I think if you look at technology as sort of broadly two kinds, one is what, continues to be and can be very local, agriculture, housing, water, many things which people are sustaining, reviving or creating new hybrid forms, but they're controlled locally. There are others that are global. For instance, the platform where you are using right now, Zoom is not something that a local community can control or uh, you know, uh, uh, digital technologies of this kind. But that's where I think it's very interesting to see things like open source technology movement, where across the world, millions of people are actually working on open source of various kinds, and then trying to link up so that they can create scale without creating the hierarchy of that scale. And I think that issue of scale then becomes very important. Scale is not about upscaling, becoming something becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, like uh, what government and corporate, uh, some NGO systems also are, uh, nor is it about simply replicating, you know, I just copy something from somewhere else because it's not going to work in my context, but it's about distributed solutions of this kind, including for technology, and then linking them up, cross-learning, exchanging, constant innovations taking place with nobody owning it. 
that's i think uh, the future that we need to look at for and hopefully maybe a year from now i know there's a number of uh, international uh, i mean sorry global platforms that are trying to create alternatives to what we're using right now alternatives to uh, capitalist forms of uh, digital communication and maybe uh, next year if we do a similar webinar we'll have something like that which is democratically controlled and not profit making by zoom or somebody else so perhaps at the root of all this uh, what both of you have said is the importance which is also brought up in Juliet Hopkins presentation of <clears throat> education and awareness based on documentation is there a need for uh, heritage activists in the present context to concentrate on documenting experiences getting these stories into a uh, situation and a position where they can be shared and that might be the all the, the most important thing at this point is to see our task in the coming months as one of education and awareness building so that these stories do not remain <clears throat> at the local level but they are uh, used to to demonstrate what ashish was just talking about a new approach to scale scale that is basically the power of the ripple effect of learning from each other of sharing experiences and drawing on strengths from other people and from that point of view do heritage activists around the world have the resources for the kind of documentation and preservation of experience and sharing of experience that all our speakers seem to indicate is so critical to the future how do you see that marilena do we have the resources at the community level can we bring resources to the community level that can empower people with the knowledge of their past and what the and their present and give them the opportunity to share this with others who are going through the same anxieties the same concerns and the same aspirations uh, this is very interesting because it was the question that I was asked at the World Heritage Forum, but it was uh, posed the other way. What can we do at the international higher, you know, at the international level of collaboration uh, in terms of governments and institutions? And that's what I said that probably at that at that level, there's quite a lot going on. Governments meet there the intergovernmental meetings, they discuss the debate, the museum for and so on. But what is happening at the community level? So this is where your question emerges. And that is where I thought probably there is a gap. Are our civil society strong enough uh, at the local level? There are many things happening, but what, what are the, you know, the, the kind of dialogues and engagements uh, between different local levels? And uh, Ashish Kotharis' work is a, an excellent example of how this, with the global tapestry of alternatives, the, how this tapestry emerges and connects bringing people together. Um, in, in the context, uh, again, the opportunity then is for the, how can we harness the, the, you know, the technological advancements uh, on, that, uh, on that level? Uh, I, I don't have the answer, I don't have the, you know, the, that knowledge, but this is clearly where, where, where the direction is going. Uh, the young people, there is now a, a, a work title of I'm a, an environmental activist. It's almost like a job. <laughs> so, uh, you know, having those types of work, works and heritage activist jobs, that creates the need for people to communicate and share that work and knowledge. So you feel that it's not anymore a kind of a marginal, uh, semi kind of uh, pr profession. It is, you know, the, this is a, a professional growing field and young people, it, this is very, very important. Uh, you know, I have to, two kids that go to school, the environment is what they're talking <laughs> all day and how can we save the planet? What's happening in the Amazon? Young people have that global view uh, and, and care, care and kindness towards the world. Uh, so uh, I remain uh, positive, despite the kind of uh, negativity that surrounds us, that um, 
there is a sense of uh, movement. Uh, but yes, to be with further research and further discussed, and perhaps I know that um, you know our conversation today involves many young people uh, dealing with these issues at a university level or just in coming out uh, of university and kind of having all these questions. <laughs> You know where are we going? What's happening? And I think it, you know, we 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 can uh, hear from them as well. I think it's a good point at which to bring in concerns from our from our listeners. Um, uh, Bharvi, are you taking a look at the chat box to see questions that can be shared with our speakers? How are we going to do that? Uh, so we don't have any questions as of yet, but we do have one okay. hand raised uh, by Lubna. If that's okay, she can come in. Thank you, Ashishji, for the wonderful uh, steps that the communities have taken during the COVID. But I would like to raise one point. For centuries, ICH has been preserved by communities without any help from anyone else, the communities themselves. And then suddenly with the 2003 convention, the state party has become the spokesperson for the communities. I'll just give you two examples from Bangladesh. The Baal songs were listed. So the state party started, have, have built an academy for the Baals. The Baals have all run away from there <laughs> because they live in Gurukuls and Accra. So the state party has no understanding of the Baal uh, philosophy. And then uh, what was listed for Bangladesh is the, the rally on the uh, first of Boishak, the New Year's rally. That is an invented tradition. And there is no, there is no really community involved in that. The community is the state party, which is trying to promote a Bengali nationalism Bangladeshi nationalism over and above everything. So I just feel that uh, there is a uh, lack of empowerment of communities, though the, their operational directives have been revised and revised again to uh, empower CIGS. But ultimately, it is the state party which is just the spokesperson. So this is what we have to deal as activists. Yes, I think that's a real challenge, but perhaps Lubna also we need to recognize that at one time it was the state that was being asked to please give attention and priority to aspects of cultural heritage which were withering away. So now we've got it in reverse that the take, taking over of the state rather than facilitating and empowering. Uh, I think Professor Polios has had his hand up. Would you like to? Join in, Ionis. Yes, um, thank you very much for this very exciting uh, presentation. And uh, uh, thank uh, Marilena, thank Assis, thank, uh, of course, Professor uh, Chatterjee. Some thoughts uh, so far. First of all, about this concept of um, pandemic crisis and the concept of crisis is that um, um, before the pandemic crisis, it was a global economic crisis. But uh, before the global economic crisis, the world has gone through so many crises, regional, global, etc. And um, allow me to say that um, we have started focusing on these crises the last years because these have affected especially the so-called Western world, while other places of the world have gone through crises for ages. So crisis is a permanent state of living. Nothing changes rapidly. And uh, there are several places in Africa, in Asia, etc., that have always been in crisis. And also the future that is coming will also be in crisis because now there might be another hygiene crisis, there might be another um, uh, immigration crisis, etc. So it's an environment of crisis that we need to live in. And um, some, um, some thoughts about um, 
um, about um, digital. Um, I mean, I remember the project about digital developments. I remember the project that we were doing with uh, uh, Marilena. Uh, it was very interesting that digital. They were we were trying to map through digital technologies the practicing of intangible heritage. For example, how they dance, how they sing, etc. And we would see that we would capturing the intangible, and through this, the knowledge of how to dance, the knowledge of how to sing, etc., could be sp spread all over the world. So this helped, especially people who who were from distant places. Um, for example, Greek traditions uh, pra being practiced by people in America, in US, in Australia, and especially young uh, people would continue to practice these intangible heritage um, elements. The other thing about digital uh, developments is that um, the concept of heritage changes. All these experiences that we are going through for example, we're watching movies, we're watching, we're playing video games with on heritage, etc. All this, we're reading books about heritage, etc. All this, the concept of heritage expands because all this can affect the way we see, we consume, and we will go and uh, um, practice heritage as well. So the concept of heritage changes. The other uh, thought that I had as you were um, discussing is that we're talking about virtual global communities. So the communities are changing. Nara Plus 20 focused on uh, virtual global communities as a key stakeholder group. And so sustainable development, not linked to a local level, but increasingly linked to a global level, which is very interesting through this digital uh, technologies, but also we are changing, especially um, through global economic crisis, through pandemic crisis, we are changing. This means that our connection to intangible heritage is changing. This means that all this inventory and documenting, uh, document, uh, documenting systems need to be updated. We need to document several of our practices again. Because some years ago, we were saying that, uh, especially in terms of World Heritage Convention, etc., that uh, you know we need to change to, to, to document sites every 30 years. Then some people would say every 20 years. Now, regarding intangible heritage elements, people were changing so fast, and the practices are changing so fast that we would need to document them as fast and as soon as possible. So it's not that we have documented some practices there on the UNESCO intangible heritage list and we are done. So documenting, uh, do documentation changing. And a last comment on, based on Marilena's uh, comment about, um, and the discussion about what is the, you know, what kind of lobbying, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, what is the future of intangible cultural heritage? I would like to, to, to give two examples, a theoretical and a practical one. The theoretical thing is that if we see, at first we're talking about risk management, every kind of dramatic change was seen as a risk. Then we talked about uh, preventive management. So uh, we need to, uh, to, to foresee change. Then we're talking about res resilience, which has to do with scale. We see resilience in, in most of the cases of, of how can we become bigger? So we have all these multinational companies, etc., which are very big. So how can we, the small ones, become bigger? But now uh, we, even business strategies talk, talks about agility. How can we adjust to a turbulent environment? And agility does not have to do with scale. The ag agility has to do with positioning in the right way. And sometimes scale is a problem to agility because big organizations find it very difficult to adjust 
to dramatic changes while local communities, local organizations, like the ones that Ashis uh, mentioned in India, find it much easier to adjust to change. Also a threat of um, a dramatic condition on um, a big organization, it's much, is a shock while a small organization can recover from that. But apart from this uh, theoretical thing, a practical aspect is that there is a market for all the, that we are uh, discussing. There is a new generation and there is research going on that there is a, a new generation of people, young people that would travel and they are, um, or would seek products uh, um, made of sustainable material, for sustainable practice, uh, practices leading to sustainable development. And they, are, they, they have the money or they can find the money and they're willing to pay more for this kind of products. So there is a concept of market trying to understand this young generation willing to spend more. A whole tourism, alternative tourism that is now becoming mainstream tourism industry is focusing on this young generation pe people that would, would go um, visit places, respect these places, meet local communities, uh, and are willing to pay for all this uh, uh, experience. Thank you very much again for this wonderful discussion. Thank you, Professor Polos. I think that's a very important issue that you've pointed to. One is that we have to learn to live with crisis as a permanent feature of our lives and to be able to manage heritage within this kind of turbulence that uh, <clears throat> is, not a, is not a choice, it's something that we're going to have to live with. And you pointed out the importance of reaching a new generation, which brings me back to this uh, point that if we say that the future for our uh, for the resilience of our cultural heritage lies in communities and in a younger generation, then what do we, what are the priorities that we need to address as practitioners and as activists in order to build that capacity within communities and within uh, <clears throat> the younger generation to deal with heritage, not as static, but as a constantly changing phenomena which has to be redefined constantly, almost on a daily basis, within a context of crisis and change. I think Kamal had his, has did his hand up. Kamal, would you like to, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Kamal from Nepal. I uh, learn and I listening this the discussion is going on very interesting and uh, diverse for me. Uh, I see there are uh, the challenges uh, for us to do and uh, still we need to uh, continue how to uh, proceed because of the, you uh, the said that the changing, what is the changing, society is changing, the youth, the younger, and they're changing. Also, we have uh, some community that are so behind in the grounds they are keeping uh, the, uh, the uh, intangible heritage with them and then they are practicing they are they are not uh, the, they cannot access uh, the information today we have a discussion about this and i uh, noticed that ashish kothari raised something from the india there's uh, the indigenous peoples and their collective work, and there's the, the inclusion. Uh, so uh, uh, for, for us, uh, maybe we need to uh, bring some of the good practices, good uh, system, there the system from the history, there's the, um, there's the customary practices and also uh, um, uh, thinking about the, the ICS is the matter of the intergovernmental agreement. So 
Uh, I haven't been in this, this the, the discussion, but it need to be and bring up and, and the human rights approach because it is the link links with the identity of the society, identity of the peoples. Uh, so how we need to pro promote and uh, protect the, 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 the uh, uh, property of the society. I think there's challenge and the rich and uh, some things and so that's the mind. Thank you, Kamal. That's very important. You brought up the issue of human rights and identity as a human right. That's something that is recognized globally, but difficult to interpret perhaps at the local level. And it immediately brings us to the point that uh, Ashish had made of um, how we tackle and how we manage the power structures and get those to change. Ashish has to leave, so I'm going to ask him to please uh, come in and comment before he leaves us. Ashish, over to you. Thanks, Ashokji. My apologies for having to leave a little bit uh, earlier than scheduled. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to um, respond to uh, two or three of the points, maybe the first one on the issue of documentation, which Ashokji, you raised, and then responses from uh, Marilena, Jonas, and others. Um, so, I mean, I think uh, one of the most important questions is, obviously we all agree that documentation is needed, but uh, the crucial question is who documents? Um, and what we've seen, of course, in the last uh, two, 300 years of uh, knowledge colonization is that it is somebody coming in from outside the community who comes and says, oh, I'm going to no document your knowledge. I will do a thesis, PhD or whatever it is. Uh, I'm not saying that that's necessarily a problem, but what we haven't done nearly enough is to enable communities to do self-documentation. And that is, uh, and that of course is not just written, it's, it's uh, video, it's audio, it's arts, it's so many different forms of documentation that would be crucial. And, and why I think this is the most important thing to do and therefore also the need for resources to be uh, provided to them is because the danger of external documentation of a community heritage is that it freezes that heritage. Somebody's done a thesis, somebody's written an article, somebody's made a film from outside and that's it. For the next 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, people just refer to that. If the people, if the communities themselves are doing the documentation, they could be constantly innovating on that. They, sorry, they could be constantly building in their innovations and changes into that documentation so that it's a bit like oral knowledge, which is changing and the forms of documentation are therefore responding to those changes. I think that's a huge challenge for all of us, especially those of us who are in a way sort of coming in from outside. Um, the, the, the issue of, uh, I think Lubna's point was extremely important. We have seen this happening not just with respect to culture and heritage, but also with respect to uh, natural resources, with, with the commons, with virtually every aspect of community life, uh, is that when the government, even with the best of intentions, steps in, it often actually does so like an elephant in a china shop and uh, ends up creating massive problems because there's a very there's a standardized approach it's uh, you know governments don't know how to work with diversity they they want especially centralized governments they 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 want something that's uniform standardized all of india must have this solution kind of thing and that's extremely dangerous so we really need to go back to the issue of what is democracy what is democratic control over heritage over nature uh, uh, sorry over uh, local commons etc um, and here then I think maybe we also need to challenge the United Nations as a system, because if you think of it, United Nations gives all the power to the nation states. Of course, there are spaces for civil society and communities to speak, but the decision making is still in the nation states. And so you will have, you will necessarily bring all the flaws of a, of a centralized nation state system into the United Nations. So we need alternative forms of global governance, which is building from people's own assemblies. Nobody knows exactly how that will happen, but something that is different from something where, for instance, the 800 languages of India could be represented at a global level rather than just maybe English and Hindi, right? So I think 
there's a lot of creative thinking that we need in this. I won't even get into the issue of challenging nation state boundaries. That's a whole separate uh, uh, area of work. And finally, uh, uh, sorry, two additional points. Uh, I think Jonas brings a very uh, important point about crises. And I think if I'm not mistaken, is he, if he's from Greece, then of course he would know that I learned this just three, four years back that crisis, the original Greek word for crisis was krisis, which means opportunity. Uh, so uh, the important thing I think is that communities, yes, in the global South have always faced crisis of some kind or the other, but they've had the opportunity and the occasion to respond and to adapt to it. Today, I think what is possibly different is that we are facing multiple crises at the same time. Here in Ladakh, where I'm sitting right now, they're facing the crisis of climate, which they have no control over. They can adapt, but adapt, adaptations are not necessarily adequate. Um, they have the crises of so-called development coming in because now the Indian government is in control of what happens here. Um, they have the crisis of the army being here because India and China are constantly at loggerheads. Everything is kind of coming in together. They've got all the market forces coming in. Food traditions are changing. Everything is, is in a rapid flux. It's very difficult for people in the global south to respond, communities on their own to respond to these three, four, five different crises hitting them at the same time. I think that's a bit of a difference in today's context. And that's why the, the responses that we need also need from local to global uh, networking, solidarity, exchanges, learning, cross-learning, uh, resistance plus alternatives coming together, all of that put together. And wherever possible agencies of the government or even who are somewhat sensitive, supporting that process without imposing from above. Um, on the issue of identity, I think Kamal, uh, absolutely right. You're, you're, you're right. I mean, again, the examples I gave are examples where people are trying to assert their cultural political identity also, not just cultural, but also political identity. Um, and uh, But doing it again in, in these sort of more complex uh, contexts. And so I think, again, uh, how do we build systems in which that assertion of identity uh, is successful without it becoming uh, right-wing xenophobic, which is, says, this is my identity. I won't allow any refugees to come in. This is my identity. I don't want Muslims here, or I don't want Christians here, or I don't want Hindus here, or whatever it is. So the, the exclusionary identity, which sometimes does happen, uh, needs to be also questioned and to say, okay, how do we build inclusionary identities? Yes, I'm an Adivasi, I'm a whatever, a Hindu, Muslim, whatever it is, but I'm not going to disrespect your identity as a, some other religion or some other ethnicity or some other nationality. I think that's another big challenge that, uh, that we have. Uh, thanks uh, for this opportunity again, and, and again, deep apologies for having to leave early, but uh, a consequence of COVID is that if you're traveling within states in India, we need what's called the RT-PCR test, which everybody's wondering whether it actually works or not. But anyway, I still need that test to be able to get back home. <laughs> so I have to go now. So sorry about that. Thank you, Ashish. That's a good note to for you to depart on because it shows that uh, crisis management comes down to the individual level, to the daily level. And also for bringing out that basically what we're all talking about is a more robust redefinition and re-evaluation of democracy in our societies. Because without that, we don't have the foundation for the kind of empowerment that we are all talking about and saying that we need. Uh, Raj Suwal, you had your hand up. Would you, you need to um, unmute yourself, please. Thank you, okay. Ashish. Yes, sir. Please go ahead, Raj. Uh, sir, uh, actually, I had to share uh, our experience in Nepal in pandemic uh, situation about and uh, ICH. Uh, in fact, uh, we consider that ICH have been a very vital social tool for um, uh, uh, tackling with the, any crisis in the community. Uh, that is why ICH have been uh, being continued. And but the thing is that uh, the pandemic has uh, 
allowed local government or the government agency to control fully the all the ICS performances in local community. Uh, what happened is uh, uh, since uh, in Nepal, we had to uh, go up to uh, the court, Supreme Court for the uh, interim order not to uh, not to ban uh, performing cultural activities, uh, ICS in Nepal uh, before six months. And the Supreme Court has issued the interim order for, the, for that particular issue. The fact is that uh, at that time, there was only uh, 100 around uh, new uh, COVID positive was uh, appearing all the, uh, every day. And if all the businesses and the major activities were continue, but the cultural activities and festive activities have been totally banned. And in that case, uh, we were up to, uh, we need to go up to the uh, court. And actually the decision not to perform ICS in the time of pandemic was taken by not the local people, not the community, but, but by the government, by the government agency. Uh, that was the problem and we uh, went up to court and up, uh, court order not to control like that and my my uh, issue is uh, the ICS convention in one way and as a uh, uh, sister already said ICS convention is uh, in one way uh, the local community uh, are the actually the owner of the uh, ICS and the all the things are doing by the community but somehow one and another way uh, government agency is uh, making control over the intangible cultural performances. So in this situation, uh, how uh, we can review about the implication of ICS convention and making state party uh, more uh, authentic to the local ICS as, uh, but uh, rather uh, we know that the local community is the authentic uh, ownership, owner, uh, authentic owner, I mean, for the ICS. So this is the situation in one side. And on the other side, I think uh, the next point I would like to raise here is uh, uh, quite different. That uh, that point I would like to raise is uh, in uh, ICS convention, 2003 convention, uh, there is no provision about the abandoned ICS. I mean, reviving the ICS that has been abandoned for the uh, 20 years, 50 years, it might be for the ge one generation or two generation, but if that uh, abandoned ICS has to be revived, then there is no provision in uh, ICS convention. Only uh, the RICS, ICS in RICS is uh, provided in convention, but ICS that is abandoned by the uh, this, uh, uh, I mean, generation, and but uh, it was practiced by the previous generation. I, it is these types of uh, examples are lots of uh, available in our community that might be in India that might be in Nepal uh, so how ICS convention can be a useful tool for addressing uh, those types of ICS which have been abandoned by uh, this this uh, generation but it was practiced by the previous generation but there is some uh, records there is some memories uh, and that need to be uh, revitalized because lots of intangible cultural uh, heritage performances and happening might be not regular. It might not be every year. A lot of uh, intangible cultural heritage uh, festivals are uh, taken for the 12 years. I think uh, we have same culture in India and Nepal in uh, several intangible cultural heritage festivals. It happens once 12 years. So once it is not performed in eight, uh, 12 years, and so uh, during that time, it, it might be changed a lot. So how uh, 2003 convention can be the better tool to address uh, revitalizing abandoned ICS? That is my another uh, uh, conception. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Raji. You've uh, raised two very important issues. Uh, one is the importance of the law and how the law looks at issues of cultural heritage. Uh, very powerful example you gave recently of what the pandemic has done. We're all experiencing that. And part of the problem that the public health officials are having on in the pandemic is this tension 
between what people consider to be their cultural right of expression and what the public health people feel requires uh, to be done in terms of public safety. But I think that might be a neglected area which we need to look at. What documentation, what records do we have of cultural heritage issues which have gone to the, the courts? And what evidence is there of legal opinion on cultural heritage? It's such a difficult area. And uh, we've talked about the risks when governments take over. Is there some work that needs to be done in terms of advocacy to sensitize legal systems to the complexity of this, of this issue? That might be something to look at. You've also raised the question of uh, languishing traditions. Uh, reviving languishing traditions. And there again, that brings us back to what several speakers have been mentioning, the critical importance of documentation and of research. And within that critical importance is the other issue that has been raised is whose heritage is it anyway? Who's doing the documentation? Uh, there's no simple answer to this. If you're talking about reviving languishing traditions, you may well require external scholars to come and at least start the process. But what we are learning through all this discussion is there seems to be one non-negotiable element that ties all this together, which is that the local community should be in charge. The local communities need to be empowered. The local uh, communities are the ones who should be calling the shots. Now we have about five minutes and I think this at this point, Neil, you might want to come in and tell us whether you're getting what you want out of this session. And is there anything else that we should do in the next five minutes to complete the record from your perspective? Neil? Thank you, Professor Chatterjee. <clears throat> this was not part of the agenda, but uh, it's always uh, very kind of you to uh, challenge us. Uh, one thing I was thinking across this discussion was uh, our role as an academic institution, what we should be doing what kind of uh, pedagogy should we be adopting what kind of field work should we be doing what kind of research should we should we be you know engaging our students and, and perhaps uh, ourselves uh, these are some of the questions i was uh, thinking uh, as i was listening to all the speakers and and uh, and i think there is some synergy uh, synergy uh, across the, the the range of uh, people that have gathered in this session so uh, to connect back to the recent comments that, uh, that Raj uh, from Nepal was raising, um, I think one of the things I am getting from this uh, discussion is that uh, perhaps at times we need to also challenge the status quo. And this might be questioning the idea of democracy and what it means, or it might be challenging the, the nation states uh, you know, at times if it is not allowing the communities to be uh, self-empowered. Uh, or perhaps even uh, what uh, uh, Asisji asked that perhaps the UN system had its own flaws and, and should we uh, you know, ignore them or should we work with that? So I think in that spirit, my thought would be that um, whatever terminology we use, whether it's intangible cultural heritage or just cultural heritage or traditional knowledge or, or traditions, um, anything, uh, there is a merit in scientific inquiry, and when I say scientific inquiry, I don't necessarily limit to just the natural sciences, it's also to the social sciences. Uh, and the merit of the scientific inquiry is, is that, you know, you follow certain uh, observations. I mean, don't just uh, make opinion, but based out on the evidence, uh, something that you are also alluding uh, just now. Uh, but then also employ the critical thinking so that don't take everything that is given, but, but see what is the relevance to the particular context. And I think that uh, is perhaps the entry point to empower the communities uh, when you contextualize whatever is given. And in that light, I would say for the interest of this uh, series of uh, discussions that we are having in this workshop, that 2003 UNESCO Convention on Intangible Cultural Heritage is a good tool. It has its own history and, and we know how, why it came to be and why what it's trying to do. And I think it's one of the good convention out of all the UNESCO's cultural conventions. However, I also see there are confusing areas. There are areas which are left untouched because they're, they're, they look so messy. Like for example, the definition of community. 
you know, since we couldn't figure out the definition of community, community, we rather expanded it to say community groups and individuals. And so that seems to be a slightly broader framework, but, but that is an unresolved issue. The similarly, the idea of participation, what does it mean? How do we empower? I think that's another area that the convention uh, is sort of vaguely hinting, but, but the good thing the convention is doing is it is emphasizing on that, that without communities consent, without communities involvement, uh, things should not be done which was perhaps was not the case in the World Heritage Convention, you know, so, so in that light. So coming to the Raj's question on the, the sort of traditions that were forgotten or abandoned, uh, that's the word he used. I would say uh, we, we need not look up to the UNESCO Convention uh, for everything, because for whatever reason, the 2003 Convention would not consider if, a, if an ICH or if a tradition is already abandoned, it won't consider that as an eligible element within the convention, which is fine because the convention's intent is to push the member states, the state governments to be proactive, to do something about it. However, if we are changing the lens and our approach is more from the community's point of view, then we, not, we need not wait for a mandate to come from UNESCO. I think we can, as a community, uh, take a proactive role and revive if that is still relevant, why not? Let's revive it. But once it is revived, and then of course you can apply the 2003 convention because now it's living heritage because you have revived it, it's, it's, it's in practice, right? And it doesn't have to be every month, that, that timeline is, is the community's decision, you know, it's a tradition. So I think we have to think about this issue uh, sometimes beyond the convention. Convention is a good entry point and it's a good tool, particularly to when you have to work with the government. You know, convention can be used if the government has ratified the tool, that in that uh, convention, this is an opportunity for us to use that and and go to our government and say, hey, you you sign this now now uh, you know uh, sort of follow this. Uh, and in the next session, I will be talking briefly about the ethics. Uh, and and the good thing about this convention is it also recognizes the ethical principles and tries to work on that. So uh, so I think uh, these are the challenges and opportunities, just like the pandemic, you know, being the challenge, but it's also. Uh, an opportunity that we discussed. So, so I would like to think it that way. Uh, but definitely this session has been wonderful uh, coming towards the end of the workshop. I think this really allowed us to question some of the things that we have been perhaps taking for granted, but also thinking future further, uh, particularly positioning ourselves in this, uh, you know, last almost two years of, of uh, disturbances that we have gone through. But as Yanis and others pointed out, this is not the first time we have gone through. And perhaps this is not the last time. So all it is telling us is this is a reminder. This is a wake up call that, you know, don't take things for granted. Question, adapt and keep moving. Uh, that's what I would say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. And I think that's a good point on which to close this discussion because we've come back to, to um, the pedagogical challenge, which is important because we are uh, having this discussion under the umbrella of, a, of, a, of an institution of learning and of education. And also we're coming back to the convention and to, the, and to the UN system, which again is the starting point for this discussion on, on heritage. We should look at the global system of governance and, the, and our own in, our local systems of govern, governance as starting points, not as the end of, of what we do. And certainly there needs to be change in those systems if what we've been talking about over the past couple of hours is ever to, uh, to come to reality. But I think we've had a rich discussion. We've had several avenues that um, have been pointed out as practical future directions that we can take as practitioners. A lot of questions have been raised for which there are no simple answers. But in a, as uh, Yanis has pointed out, crisis is going to be with us. We don't look for simple answers. What we look for is the courage and the stamina to persist in our search. So I think we've, we've demonstrated that that stamina and that courage exists, and that's the most powerful tool that we have. So thank you all very much for your participation. And over to you, Barvi, to close the event. Uh, yes. Thank you so much to all our speakers. I think um, by addressing not only the pandemic, but transcending beyond that to address uh, crises in general, 
uh, it has helped us to bring uh, all the lessons that we've uh, had so far in the workshop to bring them to the ground reality of the present and also the all the case studies that you have shared with us all the wonderful practical examples that you have shared with us shows us that you know there are uh, cases that have not only challenged the convention that we've been studying but also provided solutions to the gaps that we found in the convention so thank you so much for this wonderful uh, discussion we will end this particular session here and we will be back in 30 minutes for the final discussion on ethics as well as the assignments uh, for the final workshop so thank you so much once again and we'll see you in 30 minutes and as per the schedule uh, we're we're going to discuss the assignments or your exercise that you are going to do uh, but before that, I just wanted to uh, remind uh, some considerations on ethics, or in other words, the ethical considerations in ICS safeguarding. So I I have a PowerPoint, but I will not use that because that will take long. Uh, I will not go into that detail, but I will just like to uh, share with you <clears throat> the page on the ICS conventions uh, website under UNESCO where it talks about uh, the ethics. So I'll just uh, point out that resource to you, even though many of these have come uh, through in some of the earlier sessions as well, sessions and discussions. I think before we dive into our assignments, it is important to get into those ethical thinking and, and so that your proposal can also keep that in mind. But before we start, uh, are we good to go? Can I get a sense of uh, hand raise if you are ready to start? <clears throat> if we are there and good to go, okay, seeing some hands. All right, I think we have we have quorum here. So, so that was in some ways, uh, I was just trying to follow a process, a methodology to ensure that uh, I'm talking to <clears throat> you and I have your consent. I have your, your approval to move forward. <clears throat> so, so that is just a practice quickly I thought I would do because I couldn't see everybody whether you are in the room or not. So that was my way of ensuring that, uh, you know, uh, there is the most outcome. So, so that would be my interpretation of the best I could do at this point. So similarly, in any situations that we are doing, dealing with, um, we can make a sense. So I would not, uh, I would like to consider ethical discussions, ethical consideration as, um, as a common sense practice, I think that should be the approach that we should not be doing ethical, or we should not be thinking about ethical considerations just because the convention asks for it or for any other mandate. I think it is for our own benefit. And I will, I will uh, talk in that line of thought. Ahana, do you have any questions or is this the present hand? No, I just raised the hand because you said all right okay thank you yeah that's what i thought but maybe i didn't ask you to lower your hand yeah thanks <clears throat> so um the reason i'm saying that is let me share the unesco's uh, section where it talks about ethics and as i mentioned in the previous session uh, this is one of the good things that this particular convention has uh, but you would also recognize that the convention didn't have the ethical considerations or these ethical principles in the very beginning. It actually came after the convention was adopted and there were a lot of discussions. So finally in around 2015 only, um, the convention incorporated these ethical principles. So it is now in the oper operative uh, <clears throat> directives. And this is, as you can see in this text, uh, this was a decision taken. So uh, two things I will point out here, one is for the purpose of the convention, what the convention recommends. Uh, so the convention recommends 12 ethical principles, which are not necessarily new, uh, depending on your <clears throat> background or your professional field. <clears throat> you may have some kind of a code of ethics or, or a code of conduct, that kind of documents. And if you think about those documents, these documents are trying to remind us that there are certain expectations of being a professional in that field and that the, <clears throat> the conduct of business in the profession should be done in a certain way. So similarly, when we are thinking or we are working on safeguarding of the intangible cultural heritage, uh, and since it is mostly considered as a living heritage, it, is, it belongs to some communities or groups or individuals, 
and <clears throat> most of the time people who are the agents of safeguarding might not necessarily be from the community and therefore uh, these ethical issues becomes very important so um, you can ex access all these other experts meeting also if you want to go to the discussion and follow what was decided <clears throat> but i would just like to first to mention uh, some examples of codes of ethics that is put together in this website uh, that applies to cultural sector uh, mostly coming from the anthropological associations and you can see the code of ethics here the folklore society as you know you know 1989 recommendation on this uh, on the folklore so folklore was a key term so american folklore society had its own code of conduct uh, statement in ethics art museum professionals also have um, the Aboriginal, the, the agencies which deals with Aboriginal or tribal people, they also have their own code of ethics. So there are several sample code of ethics that you see, you know, even from tourism organization, um, UNESCO's, you know, the ethics for dealers in cultural property, um, sociological association, archives, museums, archaeological association, uh, and there are many more. We will find uh, many more uh, code of ethics around. So after studying and sort of referring to all this, uh, this convention has summarized uh, the relevant ethical principles for for the um, implementation of this 2003 convention uh, <clears throat> let me go to this. so the 12 ethical principles are i'll just highlight so first one is communities groups and where applicable individuals should have the primary role in safeguarding their own intangible cultural heritage i think this came in the last discussion also that the community should have the primary say so they should play the role how i interpret this is if i am an outsider i'm an external agency working i should keep in mind that i should not be the leader in that entire process i should only be the facilitator and the concerned communities should take the primary role and similarly, if I am one of those community members, then I should recognize that, okay, this is for myself, this is for my community, and we need to be proactive. We should not be looking up to somebody else to do this for us, All right? So that's the first uh, ethics principle. Uh, the second is the, the right of communities, groups, and where applicable individuals to continue the practices, representations, expressions, knowledge, and skills necessary to ensure the viability uh, of the intangible cultural heritage should be recognized and respected. In other words, what is uh, considered as the appropriate behavior and all that uh, has to always uh, give consideration to the right of these community and members uh, and they should decide they have the right to say which practices which knowledge is are important so so anything so the right belongs to the the community so the role and as asis was saying earlier along with the role the responsibility the right uh, responsibility right has tried a different thing the right and then the third principle is however we are doing whoever is doing it uh, there has to be mutual respect that is the third ethical principle i'm not going to read out uh, every principle i'm just pointing it out and then the fourth it says uh, all interactions with the communities uh, who create safeguard and maintain and transmit uh, ics should be characterized by transparent col transparent collaboration dialogue negotiation and consultation and contingent upon their free prior sustained and informed consent so not only all the process whether you are inventorying documenting preparing safeguarding plan or doing any activities everything should be very transparent but also should be done in a in a in a culture of collaboration which requires the dialogue negotiation and consultation but more importantly all these activities should be done only when there is free prior sustained and informed consent and this consent is one important feature that this convention introduces and let me just say why free, prior, sustained, and informed. Uh, each of these has a purpose. Free meaning that the so so basically the point is before we start the process or during the process, so every part has to have the communities, the consent communities consent, meaning that there's their agreement, their approval is necessary. Now, what kind of approval? So when we take the consent, it should be free, meaning that that approval, that agreement, that consent should not be given in exchange of anything you know somebody should not be paid or somebody should not be given a gift or somebody should not be attracted to agree for whatever reason so it should be absolutely free there should not be any other exchange to get the consent 
Okay. Now this is separate than the benefit that we discussed. You know, benefit is a separate thing. But when we are obtaining the consent, it should be free. It should not have any attachments to any other terms and conditions or or the attractions. Prior, meaning that the consent cannot be obtained after we are done or after we have started the process. It has to have the prior consent, meaning that if we are starting to document before the documentation process starts, we have to obtain the consent. So prior, so free, prior, sustained, meaning that the consent should not be taken in a way that, yeah, you agree now and we'll see what happens later. No, it cannot be. If it requires that agreement to be renewed, that has to be thought through. In other words, this has to be sustained throughout the life of the ICS, okay? And informed, and informed meaning that uh, the language we speak, the kind of frameworks we talk about, the objectives, what happens to the documentation, all that, this, everything should be informed to the concerned communities and individual members. And then only the consent should be taken. So these this four keywords that are there before the consent is an important part of our ethical responsibility. Then whatever we do, uh, there has to be access. They have to have unconditional access to these things. This came out in previous sessions as well. So just a reminder. So the principle is that. The sixth is um, the purpose of ICS safeguarding is not to um, run into any kind of a competition or putting forward some kind of a value judgment uh, and then things of that nature. It, it is not intended that. So therefore, it should not be subject to any external judgments of value or worth. So this I discussed in my first session also when I was comparing the, the convention with other conventions. Uh, the seventh is the communities, the CGI who create uh, ICS should benefit from the protection. This a couple of times we discussed that they should take, they should get the benefit. There has to be equity in benefit sharing across all the stakeholders, uh, particularly the communities. And then uh, the dynamic and living nature of ICS should be continuously respected. Um, earlier, there was a question of when it is not leaving. So this particular convention emphasizes on the leaving ICS, and therefore that needs to be respected in the manner that it is leaving and therefore it is changing. It is always evolving. So when you document something today, and next year you are observing that same practice or festival or any other ICS element, and if it has changed, you should not be unnecessarily referring to the old document, say that, oh, you changed this, this is not good. That kind of uh, approach should not be taken. We have to respect that it's a living tradition. It might change over the time. It might evolve to integrate technology or, or so many other things in the society. And that has to be very consciously respected and, and uh, given consideration. And uh, also, um, if in case there are any, any impact, any consequences and all that, uh, whether it's short term, long term or potential, in fact, we have to carefully assess. So just because we are interested in safeguarding an ICS, just because we think documenting it is, is good for the community, uh, we should not uh, move ahead along with the consent. We also need to assess the consequences, the impact, you know, in the, both the short term and the long term, direct and indirect, uh, immediately visible versus potential in future. We have to be very careful look at the consequences of all that and, and, and take actions accordingly, but it has to be done uh, before that. Because sometimes what we consider as a, a safeguarding action might actually be the destructive action that might actually uh, sort of rupture the dynamics among the communities. And if that is the situation, we don't want to do that. For example, um, trying to bring in business perspective or business models uh, if there is uh, some chances that you know eventually this might give advantage to more to one side of the community versus the other we better envision that in in advance because once we start the process and and there are these commercial aspects kicked in and you know uh, only a few community members benefit so much out of it and rest of them uh, or even the minority of them are left out of this benefit sharing process you know that could be a potential consequences in a, in a business plan so that those kind of uh, threats and the risks we have to see in advance and uh, that's also our ethical responsibility our responsibility is not just to document or uh, safeguard but also see what happens because of this particular action right um and when we do that when we assess when we um, uh, determine what is a threat what is a risk and all that it should not be just our our determination it should not be just our assessment the community the cgi should also have an important role to play. They should be involved in assessing that. And they should tell us what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. Because many times, what we as an outsider may think that is not good for the community, 
uh, may not be true. They might feel something as a good. So, so we have to again um, follow their inputs in that, which is already some point that the previous uh, points also maintained, right? Uh, cultural diversity and the identity of communities, uh, CGI should be fully respected. Uh, again, this is in line with the the previous points that uh, it intend it should intend to promote the mutual respect. Right, so mutual respect can be done only when there is enough sensitivities about cultural diversity, only when uh, different identities are recognized and respected. Right, so that is uh, the point eleven again, and there uh, specific attention to gender equality, which was a special session you had, youth involvement and respect for ethnic identities should be included in the design and implementation of safeguarding measures. And then the twelfth point is. Uh, that safeguarding of ICS is of general interest to humanity and should therefore be undertaken through cooperation among. Now, this one is from the point of the United Nations, the UNESCO's mandate. Uh, this may have to be interpreted in, in particular context. Uh, and, uh, and my sense is, if a local context doesn't necessarily go with the global, uh, then I, I think we may have to uh, listen to the local needs and local viewpoints on why, why something that they have. Uh, and and sort of accept that. So so I just wanted to flag that uh, in the ICS section of UNESCO, I will post the link again if you need a ready reference. There are these uh, ethical principles already listed, but also more importantly, uh, there are also several other professional organizations uh, ethical principles code of ethics code of conduct uh, mentioned. It's worth having a look at that because sometimes what we think is a good thing to do, and we are always inclined to do that, uh, sometimes uh, may have to be questioned. So, so we need to be aware of those issues. So while you are uh, preparing a plan for safeguarding or even aiming to document uh, an ICH element, uh, I would like to uh, encourage you that uh, please keep in mind the ethical consequences. And there might be more uh, ethical issues than what we might have covered in these websites. Uh, but let's consider that as an important uh, responsibility for ourselves and then move forward. Um, so I will stop at this point and, uh, and then we can have some discussion if you have, and then we can talk about the assignment. Any, any comment or questions at this point? Yes, Kamalji, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, it's it's very important and uh, uh, it's very also there is the informative uh, your presentation in short and uh, very good uh, captures <clears throat> uh, regarding these ethicals uh, i think there are some uh, still in gap we need to work in in more about this the pre-prior informed consent we use in different but here is the, the word is the sustain. Maybe they have a meaning of that, but we use the free power and consent. So it's also it's a good debate is going on why it's free, what we need to do in the things in uh, the, the UN brief, the, the declaration of the indigenous people's right, they use more about the free and prior and consent. Uh, now the CBD is in the, also using that and the, and the ILO 169. So maybe we need to look you know, for the, the harmony of this. And also there is the community protocol or community biocultural protocol is coming. So we need to, I think so we need to uh, see that one. But in the taking the uh, prepared um, consent is that there, there should have some mechanism how to work. It may be different as the academic or maybe in the industrial or business or any corporate corporation. Maybe it should be di uh, different, but we are uh, more thinking about the academic purpose, how we should do take this the prepare in concern of the community. So maybe that's uh, the point to discuss. And uh, the regarding the beneficiary, may I, for me, there should be some mechanism how the benefits will go. Uh, that, that's the thing, something uh, I raised. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Those are very important points. Um, in fact, uh, what you mentioned, the community biocultural protocols, I think that's a good practice which came through the Convention on Biological Diversity. I think we have a, a lot to learn from that uh, because CBD is one of my favorite conventions because not only it has those ethical issues, but it also uh, recognizes the ICS even before the you know ICS convention uh, took shape. So, so thanks for reminding us of that, which I did mention in my uh, first lecture also. Um, in fact, uh, the biocultural protocol reminds me uh, uh, while we can also share on this, uh, our own experience. Uh, but uh, from Ahmedabad University, when we work with communities uh, as our learning process, um, we have learned, uh, you know, the preparation of biocultural protocol that has been done with some communities. I think that's a good model. Um, what that, the gist of that model is, when we can't work with a community, let's first set out the ground rules where all the key stakeholders from the community, uh, the local governance, if there are NGOs involved, if there are researchers involved and we are individually involved, uh, let's sit around and let's have the protocols laid out. I think that's that would be the best thing, you know? But the problem is uh, we may not want to reinvent the wheel every time. And therefore looking at some of the best practices are always good. So if you have an access to some uh, by uh, the community protocol already, I think that's a good starting point. And then look at it and, and decide which one applies to your context and agree. Uh, I think when you have this kind of a protocol uh, collaboratively worked out with the respected communities and the, uh, the concerned stakeholders uh, involving both the government, government agencies and the communities and the local governments, within the communities also, you may have some kind of a hierarchy or some kind of governance system, local governance system. So, so when all of this sit together and laid out a principle, for example, what kind of elements should be documented? What information should be written? And what information should not be written or should not be shared with others? And uh, what to be done? What is the purpose of it? In what form do we do it? Who will keep it? How, in what forms, right? Uh, so, so one of the things that may emerge from this discussion is not everything may need to be documented or should be documented. Okay, uh, because uh, as somebody pointed out earlier, uh, sometimes the documentation becomes the beginning of the deterioration because once you document, it gives a different kind of uh, understanding and, and probably it, it attempts to freeze. Whereas that's not the idea with the ICS or the living heritage, right? So, so all these, so in fact, those 12 principal principles that I just repeated from UNESCO's website actually reminds us from multiple dimensions that before we start our process, let's sit down and recognize what are we going to look at? Why we are looking at it? What happens after this? Where do you want to go? What is needed? You know, everything. And, and let's not assume that everything needs to be documented. Let's not assume that every ICS elements need to be uh, shared with others because there are many uh, aspects of ICS which are so secret, right? There are secret knowledges, secret recipes, secret prayers, secret traditions. Uh, but then within that also, maybe there are uh, mechanisms, right? And also the benefit sharing and the social equity and gender. As much as these are global issues, I would still recommend that uh, discussing this at the community level in that particular context is a good idea because then you will understand um, what, what is the um, levels within the community. And of course, as one stakeholder, we can give our opinion that if something is, uh, is really, uh, it seems like uh, not, not so good practice in today's times, uh, perhaps we can flag it, but when we flag it, another principle comes in that we have to do it with respect. We have to uh, sort of, you know, uh, keep in mind our own position and and bring it. And and if anything has to be changed, it should not be driven by the experts or the United Nations uh, framework or anything. I think it should be gradually discussed, and the community need to ad uh, understand the change, and they should feel the need for it, or they should agree for it. Then only it should be done and also i think uh, there has to be some kind of a um, regular revision process there has to be some some local mechanism whereby somebody is monitoring this you know once we have the protocols uh, protocols itself doesn't do anything somebody has to follow the protocols so whether we are following or not and whether we have the same understanding or not is also a big question because many times from the same circumstances we may assume something uh, as as the reality, but the reality might be something else. So so I think there are a lot of these dimensions which uh, comes from the anthropological uh, approaches. Um, you know the the biodiversity uh, field already has uh, you know considered these 
uh, and many of these also are related to the relation with the nature right and it's not just about culture but also how people uh, live with nature interact with nature uh, abstract the resources from nature and all that uh, so these are not simple things so i think i'm not suggesting that those 12 principles are are uh, are able to capture everything and all the dynamics no these are just the reminders uh, but we have to frame our own on code of conduct before we start so so that's something i wanted to point out and so that uh, when you uh, are preparing a proposal to work on something uh, please consider this aspect also and maybe think of a methodology how would you go and discuss and perhaps uh, you know bring it up if you yourself are a member of the community then also think yourself in two lights in two position because you are a member of the community so you would be knowing the issues of the community and all that but please keep in mind the very fact that you are going to do some initiative on this which was not there before right that means you you also have another identity you are also somebody else other than the local community because the local community are not thinking about it and now you are thinking about it meaning that you have some agency you have some some background you have some connection so bring that so so you know understand your position uh, your identity uh, your um, background you know uh, and and put forward objectively to understand that you should not be the one taking the lead in your entire community where uh, the other members may not be uh, so comfortable with your ideas because your ideas might be coming from after this workshop or reading the unesco texts right but unesco text is nothing they your community members may not be aware of it right and just because you come from the same community and you are so interested about this ics doesn't mean your fellow brothers and sisters and you know your your families would be agreeing on that because you by the virtue of your education and your connection and you know participating in this workshop you might have changed your 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 thought processes slightly differently than rest of your community members so are you recognizing that i think these are some of the nuances that i'm i'm suggesting that we should uh, think about it uh, perhaps we may not be able to do uh, the best job because it's it's almost impossible i think it's very difficult and therefore i think we should be humble we should always be open to listen to others and and constantly get feedback and move slowly i think this should not be done in a rapid pace there is no hurry there is no deadline as such and the most important thing i would i would like to mention and i will end there is that any ics safeguarding or whatever word you, we use whether we are reviving a lost tradition or whether we are promoting a very active tradition or anything we are doing with our own cultural heritage we should do it for ourselves or the concerned community it is not for unesco it is not for tourists it is not for the government it is for ourselves and i think that will remind us the ethics that we should follow okay so i will stop at this point if there are other comments uh, we can discuss and then we can i'll i'll just go on. and then maybe you because the the assignment is written in the uh, the the booklet that was shared with you so you might have gone through that if there are anything you would like to flag or or share discuss uh, we can do that um uh, uh, yeah kajal please go ahead. so actually i want to ask like how should we go for proposal actually it's my very first time sure so, uh, like can you just uh, say okay we have done we have chosen uh, me and my classmate have chosen the one ich element and okay. we are in a documented documentation process where are we are we preparing questionnaires for that mm -hmm. community so like uh, there is methodology and then the last success of indicators so things like that how should we go for that like what's what's needed what are what are they you are looking for in our one proposal so it can vary from case to case and you can decide any uh, your own way because i mean anyway this is not uh, uh for a degree or anything so we're not going to grade and you know do that uh but i think what we are trying to um, do is can we apply this learning this discussion that happened over the uh, past two weeks uh, to some real case and can that be helpful somewhere that's the whole objective now um if you have decided on an element if you are interested in element uh, this assignment is all about how would you go about you know working on that particular ich uh so it's a proposal right so if it is a proposal then uh, like for example if you have already prepared the questionnaire so you know what kind of information you are sharing uh, but maybe now you might want to include after today's discussion that okay i have prepared the questionnaire 
but uh, should I think of my methodology? How do I approach them? You know, because if you are starting fresh, then you might want to say, no, the first thing I might have to do is build my rapport with these communities, meaning I have to establish a relations with them. So your challenge could be that since you said it's your first time, your major challenge right now could be that you have to approach these communities first, because as we just discussed, you know, without their consent, we should not be doing it. Right. So how would you, so your proposal might focus on the very first stage of your process that uh, I would like to do a series of consultation meetings with the community members. And therefore this proposal is to organize some uh, or, or to prepare towards this ICSF guarding project. So it's not the full project, but towards that. So uh, you might want to refer to some of the ethical considerations and say that, how am I going to establish my, what is my plan? Would you be visiting the community first and then uh, contacting them or do you already know somebody and, and that is your uh, person? If that is the case, then you might want to uh, look at, let's say, for example, the Anthropological Association's uh, Code of Conduct, where they recognize, and anybody who is from anthropology or who have studied a little bit of anthropology would know that in such situations, you always have a gatekeeper, right? I mean, whoever leads you to the information, that person may actually be uh, functioning like a gatekeeper who controls what you should know, what you should not know. Right now, how would you come overcome those? So you have to keep in those mind. So maybe make a plan that okay, we'll uh, you know go and visit the community. Maybe we'll visit the school first and interact with the kids there to understand what are important cultural it is here. So maybe this proposal is only the uh, prelim, prelim, preliminary proposal to understand some of the key ICS in that community. Okay, so your proposal could go towards that. Uh, but then it is always a good idea to keep in mind okay why we are doing it. If ultimately this idea is to prepare a safeguarding uh, document or, or process, um, then you might want to think about that so that even if you focus on the preliminary uh, rapport building as your proposal, you can always have future like, okay, after this, what is next? You know, And those can be mentioned briefly. So typically I would think the, the document, whatever we have listed, gives you an idea that like, for example, you should have background or the context it should also have some thoughts on why this is important. Uh, and then it should mention what are your objectives? What would you see uh, that ultimately would happen? And what is the methodology you follow? Uh, who are the stakeholders, right? Uh, and then who are you working with, potential partners? Uh, and then uh, timeline and the others might vary from case to case. You might not have to do. So Kajal, what I suggest is um, you think about all these things and, and give it some thoughts. And maybe what we can do in, in the coming weeks is uh, we can have some session to just go through your case and, and discuss briefly. Uh, but by doing this, we are not suggesting that uh, you are committing a real work now because that is a long way process. Uh, we are only trying to sensitize you towards uh, this, this kind of activities. Uh, so... Um, oh, thank you, so. Yeah, so I think this relates to Ahana's question that you know in this time you cannot travel. And so we're not expecting that. Uh, please don't travel just to do this assignment because that is, I think, too much to ask. We're not asking that. We're only asking you to conceptualize something, okay? And uh, and some of you might already be working with some communities. And if you are already working, you are already in a you know you know some some phase of your your project or your uh, initiatives. Uh, you might want to still now reflect on okay, did I miss something? Did I take the content? Uh, then it's okay. It's not too late. You know, now you realize that oh, actually you have come to let's say you know some stage to the project. And you realize actually you didn't think about the consent in the beginning because there are a few people who invited you or you had their agreement and they are the key people you worked, but then you never thought about this consent. You can always go back and ask the, the, the your key people that, okay, we have come this far, but should we have a meeting maybe with the communities, you know, major, uh, majority of the community to just discuss what we are doing, what has happened so far and how they feel is it relevant. You can always go back and discuss because these processes are not necessarily a linear process. You can always go back and forth and all that, right? Uh, so uh, I hope I have answered Ahana's question also that please uh, do not do not take like you have to produce a work here. No, we're only, only trying to sensitize you. Uh, we're not going to monitor, we're not going to guide you as such, but I think the learning of the workshop, we're trying to make it applicable in, in some ways in your case, that is the idea. Yeah, so I think more individual case discusses we can do in the coming sessions, whatever we organize and part, we will get back to you on that. But please do your homework, I mean, articulate some thoughts, maybe uh, have a one page write up or something, have some structure. Uh, 
uh, and then we can have uh, you know individual consultations uh, just to you know clarify things um yes so do we do it in a group or in in individual capacity uh, i personally would prefer uh, groups because it's a large group here uh, so if all of us do individually then that may be too time consuming uh, so my preference would be to work in groups if it is possible but if you are just by yourself and you don't have a, a group mate who could work on the same thing it's okay you can work individually also uh, and some of you i recognize that you are already working uh, with some organization or in some of you are working together so if you can if you have a group and and you you figure out your group uh, there is no specific thing but it is two to three people in a group would be a, a decent group uh, but otherwise if somebody is working individually that's also totally fine uh, yeah individual also is fine yes um what else I actually have a quick question as well. I'm just looking yeah. at the, uh, your suggested instructions here. Mm -hmm. So it seems that, um, so create a proposal for documenting, inventorying, self safeguarding this element and to come up with a detailed action plan. So in a way, I mean, no matter what we work on, you know, I guess if you're already uh, familiar with the ICH and then all of that, then you might have an action plan, but um, yeah. like a, a Kajal, you know, if you're coming in in this, uh, in this um, you know, area for the first time, can we just focus on the identifying and all these, uh, uh, mentioning all these issues that we learned for the past two two weeks? It's just a very overwhelming. Person. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> a lot so of Kajal's stuff, yeah. case was that, yeah. So, so uh, yeah. somebody like Kajal who said it's the first time, yes, not the detailed action plan because that's too too early and, and perhaps it will challenge your own ethical sense, right? So you don't want to get into that, definitely. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. Another idea, as we said earlier, is uh, uh, if you are comfortable and you have some recent process done and you are clear and you you can you are okay to make it public, uh, and there if there is a consent from respect, and, and we are not talking about the consent as a very documented thing, but you you think I mean yeah it's okay I mean I can share my thoughts about this particular ICH. Uh, we are thinking that maybe uh, with the help of HCAP, we might put together a kind of a not a hard copy publication, but maybe a digital collection of all these ICS uh, cases that you have uh, shared and what could be done with this as a suggested, suggestive, you know, initiatives. And, and the hope is uh, maybe if you are really genuinely interested, maybe some of the local agencies or whoever might be uh, getting in touch with you and so that something happens. That's, that's our core interest. Uh, but definitely we are not any decisive authority or anything there. Um, so yeah, that's why I think we'll discuss case by case. That's why your next next few weeks would like to have one on one conversation with uh, with most of you. Uh, but again, that's not totally mandatory. Uh, if it is too much, then Barbi, please. Yeah, I just want to sort of uh, summarize all these um, comments. So um, mm. as Yojang and also Kajal uh, said that this might become a little overwhelming in terms of the assignment. So the purpose of the assignment is to just um, sort of understand that all the concepts that we have covered so far in the workshop can be applied in a real case scenario. So it's not, we are not looking at a very full fledged sort of a proposal, like probably what Anna did in, in you know, a large scale community on a large scale geographical location. But even if you could probably identify a community just sort of analyze what kind of ICS they have, what kind of problems in safeguarding they are facing and come up with uh, perhaps two to three really practical solutions or, uh, you know, sort of a way forward, then I think even that could be considered as a good uh, learning exercise. And we would be happy to, you know, know that you have understood and sort of that that uh, thinking has been triggered in you um, after, for, after all of these uh, sessions. So it doesn't have to be a very grand plan, but it can be something very basic, very um, on the ground. But um, please make sure that it is something practical, something that comes from uh, probably real life experiences, which would help a lot. But definitely something that is practical, even of, even on a smaller scale. So right. uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good point, Varvi. Thanks. Uh, so we don't need to aim to do everything in this proposal. Uh, let me give an example. For example, uh, in Ahmedabad, uh, what we had seen is um, you know around that uh, february 14th the bakar sakranti uh, the big kite, kite festivals is a big thing there which is a traditional thing but also has taken new shapes right and there maybe you know uh, we see that you know the businesses that are happening around the kite festivals 
it has its own issues. So maybe let's say I want to work on that. So, so I don't need to now work around Kite Festival so much because it's already there. It's not dying or anything. But I see that, you know, the, the benefit sharing part because it's a big business now. And I feel that, you know, the, 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 some of the communities are not benefiting from it. So I have a proposal to uh, make sure that, you know, the, the communities in Ahmedabad benefited from uh, more from it than people somewhere else. So I might have a proposal on that because that also helps to enhance the, uh, the social equity part of <clears throat> the, the safeguarding of this ICA, which is already safeguarded. Nobody has to safeguard it. So, so it can also be, uh, you know, issues based. Sometimes uh, addressing the gender issues, sometimes addressing the other social issues, or or perhaps sometimes connecting with the market uh, thing because uh, economics is an issue because it's not really contributing to the economic thing. So connecting to you know lectures by uh, Ananya and Yanis and and Harriet and others, uh, you might want to just focus on that. So you can also decide that way. Uh, so so we are open. So the text that we have given is is just suggestive. You can pick a few things there, uh, and I think there maybe we'll. Uh, refine it that, that because it was it was drafted without knowing all of you now that we have interacted so now we have a sense of what uh, you know you might be doing so when we wrote we might have been thought thinking about just one kind of a cases so 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 i think we are flexible there is no hard hard and fast mandate but as varvi mentioned we want to also try for ourselves that the workshop that we design whether it makes sense somewhere or it's just a very hypothetical academic exercise and we don't want to do hypothetical exercise we want to make it relevant that's the interest uh, yes, Pravinji. Uh, before Pravinji, let me just answer um, Raswal's question. Um, uh, for this one, uh, we don't ask you to write uh, that, that that doctrinal study would be kind of a research paper, which is wonderful. If you are able to do it, uh, I would encourage you to definitely do it. And, and perhaps uh, you could submit it to our journal, Journal of Heritage Management. Uh, we publish. It's twice a year. Uh, blind peer review journal, uh, getting international traction now. So... Uh, so you might do that. You don't have to submit to this workshop, uh, but maybe, you know, it's a higher level work. So worth considering and maybe a conference. We might be organizing conference in the future, so it could be presented there. Uh, but for this one, we just want to see some applicable, you know, small thing on the ground. Um, we don't want to give a template. I think if you have uh, uh, an issue in mind, uh, an ICS in mind or a certain issue within an ICS practice, uh, let's discuss that and maybe we can think of some, some, uh, some template for that particular case. I would not like to issue a standard template. Now I'll go to Pravinji. If I start reading, then you'll be waiting there. Good afternoon, uh, Neil Kamal Dai. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, as I've already mentioned, I'm working, I've been working in this uh, intangible culture heritage preservation for the last four years. So my question is that, uh, can we use some of the project documents uh, as uh, the as an assignment, uh, but there is the question of uh, the patent right and the donors uh, issue. So, but those uh, those publications and those uh, uh, what we call uh, audio visuals, audio visuals that products have already been launched. So, I uh, I want to use the those because those those are my practical examples, and we can learn from the uh, from that. So, can I present those as a assignment or not? Yeah, certainly you can. We have no issues. Only thing I would flag is uh, since it is uh, done with an organization and perhaps for them, uh, I think you would consider your ethical responsibility to uh, get an approval from them or you know inform them where you are using this material. And if they are okay and they give you permission, we have no no issues. No, uh, definitely uh, this would be also kind of a visibility uh, platform for us and definitely the donors don't have any issue regarding that and we can use uh, this platform as a promotional of our project as well so i take it certainly that that would be fine that would be fine but then um, uh, let's also try to apply as varvi said let's try to apply the lessons learned yes. through this workshop exactly and then perhaps enhance it rather than just documenting and sharing uh, of course we'd like promote promotion i would like to promote your activities but uh, let's sort of take it to the next level and if it would feel good if our workshop helps you to take it to the next level okay thank you yeah, thank you. Um, Chandra Prakash, uh, would you like to say it out? Otherwise, I can read that. Uh, you have mentioned in the previous sessions also that you are working with some communities there. Uh, so again, um, you don't have to do extra work by going to the community and do that because this is just a proposal. This is not the real project. So if you give us a sense of what already happened and what you are planning to do, and there maybe you know uh, have a plan for your next state, and if there uh, something is useful from this workshop, I think that's what we want to see. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, uh, your actual work can happen in your own schedule, not necessarily for the submission here. Uh, but please do keep in mind several issues discussed and see how it might inform your next steps. Uh, so I hope that is uh, helpful for you. Any other thoughts, comments? Um, Kamalji has a question on the assignment. So um, you could do ethical analysis, but again, I think this will be slightly higher level of, uh, of write-up than what we are looking at the assignment. So I would encourage you to write a paper and perhaps um, present in a conference, uh, uh, which we also organized. We have not organized uh, in the last year because of the pandemic, but uh, it's it's due. Um, or otherwise, again, <clears throat> the of heritage management we have or other activities. And if nothing else, um, I think um, uh, now that you shared your some of your work in, in previous sessions, I know that you have worked a lot of uh, a lot in terms of biodiversity and culture connections. So that kind of cases we find very relevant for, if nothing else, at least for our program, you know, to for our academic purpose also. So maybe we might use it, but uh, for the assignment for this workshop, I would not suggest to do the analytical papers yet. Uh, hello. Yeah. Well, yes, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I was wondering uh, about the approval of the community. Mm -hmm. uh, if we may um, use citations, and if we um, refer to uh, where we have collected some material from, it may not be a first hand source, but it may be a second hand source, uh, some research work that someone else is. Um, conducted before on uh, the theme or on the topic that I will be working on. And I may be using that uh, for my proposal. And if I um, cite that source, uh, will that be an issue? Or do I have to reach out to the person who has made the original no, no. work and then? No, I think once you cite, then you have, you have acknowledged that. So, so uh, as yes, long as you are aware of those academic uh, considerations, yes. I think it's okay. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Priyanka has raised her hand. I'd actually just type okay. my query in the uh, chat box as well. Um, since right, we don't right. know what everyone's element is, it might be useful. So, you know, I mean, I'm particularly interested in looking at some element that is anchored around natural resource management. Mm -hmm. Now, um, particularly perhaps irrigation practices. But if there's another few other people that are also doing right. it, then it'd be useful that we could come together as a group and we could decide which element we could study based on the information that's available or if someone's anchored in some project. Yes, um, that's, a, that's a good suggestion. In fact, uh, so Barbie, maybe we can share what we know so far, right? The selected cases, uh, but there might be changes as well. So Barbie, how do we go about that? Uh, so what I was uh, thinking of was I will create an Excel sheet in, uh, today and I will mm -hmm. circulate the link uh, amongst everyone. And what you can do is you can perhaps uh, write your, uh, the element that you, or the area that you're looking at and write your name against it. And then whoever wants to add on can keep adding their names and then we have uh, di proper divided groups. So even those who are indiv working individually can also fill in. So we have a rough idea of who is doing what. So I will be sharing that Excel sheet with everyone today. Yeah, so that should help, yeah. Um, Sweta has a very detailed uh, question here. Um, so Sweta, looking at your comment, um, looks like it's a kind of a <clears throat> research project. Um, and, and methodology you are mentioning seems fine. <clears throat> so, I think that could be the starting point for you to make a sense of what's happening, what are these uh, ICS, potential ICS, and based on that, if you would like to take it forward in terms of safeguarding or, or anything, maybe that could be the focus of your proposal. Uh, because what you have written, uh, these are all fine. Uh, because that will give you an idea. And in fact, uh, any ICS we pick uh, without doing a bit of a research, um, we should not move forward because uh, that's not that. So research is fundamentally uh, important as a starting point. And research could be secondary research, it could be just in a literature review kind of research or just knowing more about it <clears throat> before we actually go to the community and all that. So, so those steps would be required. So, so in your case, since you're already doing that or you have already done that, I can see that Swetha can have a 
uh, proposal which utilizes these outcomes to the to take it to the next level. Uh, whereas some others may have the proposal where they have to even do these points that Sweta mentioned, uh, and there might be different ways of doing it. Does that help, Sweta? Yeah, it helps very much. Uh, also, yeah. I just to uh, your suggestion. Um, on where should I sort of uh, draw the line? Because it's kind of, uh, as I mentioned in the question, it's kind of snowballing. Uh, you know, uh, I go to, I've been interacting with the community. I myself, I'm a part of the community. I'm a member. Mm -hmm. uh, so I uh, have done my primary and secondary research for that. Uh, uh, so when I interact with these people, uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, I get a lot of other, other connects, uh, other uh, connections that I think, yes, this is also required. So uh, if, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a good thing, but if I keep on doing this, is uh, it's going to take a long, uh, long time. So uh, any any suggestions on that, sir, please? So again, uh, just think a small part of it and then have a proposal around it. That's it. I think you don't have to do everything in this one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Professor, we have a qu question from Monique. Um, I lost it. Yeah. Are we supposed to focus on just one element or can we focus on a particular communi uh, community and cover various elements available in that community? Uh, I think Professor's. Uh, uh, network is a bit of an issue, but if uh, yes, so do you want to answer that question? Um, what was the question? I think I, uh, yeah, I don't Monique, think I listened to all that. Uh, Monique asked if we can hmm. focus on one element of a particular community or cover various elements available to in that community. So either focus okay. on an element or focus on the community. Uh, what is no, I think you could focus on just one. Uh, I mean, depends if, if, uh, but then that proposal might be bigger if you focus on too many elements. Yeah. But at the same time, if the elements are interconnected and it makes sense to look at the whole picture, then bits and pieces of it, uh, you can decide. So depending on the case, you can decide. And these are proposals, and we didn't uh, so so uh, we didn't want. Uh, even though we we wrote detailed action plan, what that means is we want you to think it through. That how uh, the documentation would be done, or the inventory would be made. What are the possible issues there, how would you address and all that. So uh, my sense would be that uh, probably taking one element would make sense to start with. Uh, but otherwise, uh, if uh, the situation is so that you know, the larger picture makes sense, then it doesn't matter to go from the other side also. Uh, but my hunch is uh, probably focusing on one element is is a good idea. Yeah, Barbie, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so um, I think looking at Monique's uh, comment and also uh, Shweta's comment, this is something that even I had faced during my dissertation. So probably um, something that I did to help. So in case there is a uh, confusion in uh, selecting the element, what would also perhaps... Uh, one second. Sorry. What would also perhaps help is uh, to start with the goal of the project or probably the methodology of the project. So um, it depends on how, what direction you want to take your project in. So if you want to safeguard it, then probably that would help you connect which community or which element would require that attention the most. Or if you want to probably document it, then which element has not been documented or which element has a gap in that. So probably looking not at the community, but probably at the goal of your, uh, the objective of your proposal would also uh, help. So you can um, try that approach as well. Yeah. Yeah, and just to add to that, uh, one of the simplest thing you could do is think about it as trying to contribute to the sustainable development of the respective community. And how can that be done? It might be a very big development thing, or otherwise it may be a, small uh, initiative towards contributing in their sustainable development. So if you keep that as a focus, then I think uh, that will give you some clue and, and at least just one initiative is, uh, or one aspect is good enough. You don't have to do everything. And again, as you are probably making sense, I mean, we're not so, um, we don't have a very um, specific expectations or this thing, but, but again, the idea is, can ICS contribute to sustainable development? Because ICS should not be just safeguarded for the, you know, just to showcase and all that. It should eventually contribute to the benefit of the society or the community concerned uh, by way of, you know, thinking this sustainable development is a larger framework. 
and there the social equity education you know you have the 17 development sdgs right sustainable development goals so so keeping that in mind if at all anything that you are looking at is actually beneficial to the community towards uh, their sustainable development uh, please think that and how can you do by connecting to the market or developing a business plan or perhaps addressing a gender issue or perhaps even documenting and making sure that that is well known uh, if that contributes and, and you feel that you know that will uh, uh, increase the self pride or you know the self confidence in the community and that's also fair enough you know it's it's helping in the local governance there could be many aspects so uh, please think that way we're not doing it for our interest it is our interest to help the respective communities and how can we do it yeah the ethical issues we discussed uh, may not necessarily be in the proposal very feasible but while you are writing different parts of it your methodology you can keep those points in mind and if you feel necessary then you can highlight certain aspect and and uh, and address that for example if you uh, want to emphasize that uh, the consent building is the key process in your in your uh, work then you work around it that this is how i will go about building the consensus i will go and have uh, two community meetings i will go and have a session at the school local school and talk to the school students and and try to uh, use them uh, so so something like that or if you are thinking about a participatory approach you can articulate how that would work uh, because if you say participatory approach and you will say you will reach out to the uh, to the uh, let's say village councillor and then the councillor will help and uh, that doesn't look very participatory because it's only working with one or three you know how would we do that so 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 that way so i think uh, what we can do as varvi said uh, let's first sort out what we are interested in and we are not expecting that each one of you would have a case to work on uh, because some of you might be completely new uh, into this area of thinking whereas some of you are already working and you are work, doing a good job already uh, so uh, i think having this sense of okay what's what's the options here what i can bring in as an option maybe that's first step and then maybe we can guide you to uh, you know make a group so that we have uh, groups so that even if you don't have a plan to work on something but joining a group and helping the group develop a proposal you might learn something which might be beneficial to you so i think we can approach it that way also so i, I like varvi suggestion to of sharing the excel sheet uh, uh, and you all give your inputs and uh, varvi if you want to give certain timelines so maybe by sunday uh, everybody would have figured out what they would like to do whether they would join a group or if there is a group form then on monday we we have a clarity and we can uh, have some discussion uh, and maybe varvi along with in your in your sheet you can also ask people to give the uh, contact emails or phone numbers if they are uh, you know open so that uh, by sunday if you work with each other and determine uh, then on monday if we have a clarity of which group and if you in case manage to even discuss among yourself and, and decide on the nature of your proposal uh, then i think uh, monday's uh, discussion will be much more concrete uh, is that a feasible thing to do over the weekend if you just uh, you don't have to do the assignment entirely you just figure out which group you are working what is it that you are focusing on and uh, i think uh, better would be to form a group because yeah. it not only you know uh, gives an opportunity to you to know somebody else and you know be a good friend uh, but also maybe it's a network you know it might uh, go forward so uh, again networking uh, might happen through this yeah um i would suggest i will make the groups by um, today so i would suggest using the rest of today and the whole of tomorrow to sort of understand who you're working with and probably take sunday to meet once before the monday session to sort of uh, get a general idea of where you want to go to uh, which direction you want to go in and then on monday you can come uh, with your thoughts uh, and we can discuss that and then we can go forward with the uh, with the assignment so i would suggest that you sort of form your groups by tomorrow at the end of the day so you have one uh, sunday one day for uh, discussion amongst yourselves yeah. and if in case any group would like to just have a brief uh, consultation with us uh, can we uh, meet them on sunday or maybe later tomorrow uh yes i think that would also be possible i think we could give them time to form the groups tomorrow and then uh, okay. keep a session on sunday okay so that's an optional if you need to uh, meet us on sunday please uh, email varvi and me and we can uh, see what time on sunday we can meet yeah yeah, yeah. or otherwise you email us your consent and we'll respond i think that is also easy way yeah. because it's weekend everybody might have their own time so we don't want to occupy the weekend yeah 
Yeah. Okay. Um, I think Naina Jerome's his question is already addressed that um, you can either do individually or in group. Uh, we prefer group because then it becomes uh, fewer cases to look at. Uh, but if absolutely you are working individually already, then uh, I think that's fine. Yeah. So the last day to submit, we'll discuss on Monday. You will have a few weeks to finish up. May, may I give a suggestion on that? Please, uh, please, Yanis. Um, even if you would like, I mean, you're working on a project individually, it might be interesting to have, uh, um, you know, some, uh, some outsiders, in quotation marks, from your project to your yes. project to have some ideas that um, you would apply from uh, some ideas from uh, these two weeks that you could apply. It would be good uh, for you because you will have some um, an update of your running project, but at the same time, it would be good for them because they would get involved into um, an ongoing process. So, uh, I mean, we would encourage you to work yeah. in groups one way or another to put like yeah. that. Okay. I agree with Yanis. So even if you have a project already going on, you are an individual, maybe you open up for other people to join your group so that uh, they will also help you. Know, they become your peer support, peer um, team members. And, and, and uh, while you get inputs from them, they will also learn something from you. I think that peer learning is very important. In fact, I'm tempted to suggest that on Sunday, if at all you have time and you have interest to have a session, uh, do it among yourselves as a peer session. You know, I think that's more beneficial than uh, talking to us because you have heard us enough in the past two weeks. So I think uh, this is a time to aim for peer learning. That will be more beneficial. But if at all our input is required, we are open for Sunday sometime. Uh, Kajal has a question. What if you are already working in? That's perfect. That you are already yeah in a good shape. So when you submit the, I mean, when you uh, your inputs on. The seat that uh, Varvi will share, you can already mention that these, these, these people are working in this group. Yeah. And then you can also indicate where you would welcome more group members or you are sort of close group. I hope you are still open on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I would suggest one more way of looking at the groups would be probably um, a sort of, if you're not sure of what element you want to go into, you can also look at the objective of the uh, of the project. So in case someone wants to look at safeguarding, then they can choose the project or the group that is looking at safeguarding or inventoring or something like that. So I will also make sure that there is one column which sort of states the um, sort of a rough objective of your uh, uh, project. So that will also help people in uh, sort of gauging which area you're uh, looking towards. So I think that should also help, yeah. Okay, so... So I think now um, most of the sessions are over. We have only the final day on Monday to have the final discussions and the concluding session. So now I think it's time to learn from the peers. So I hope you have uh, been noticing each other. So now reach out to each other, make a group, you know, have some discussions and take it forward that way. And we'll be happy to facilitate uh, however we can in the coming weeks. And on Monday, we'll also decide uh, which days or times on the weeks and the following weeks we can meet. Um, that will not be very mandatory, but it will be an option given to you for any discussion that you'd like to have. Okay, so I think with that discussion, we had come to some clarity about it, which even I didn't have what would be this assignment all about, even though initial thoughts were given. So thank you for your inputs and, and all the suggestions. Uh, so while we will send that seat, please take it and uh, Sunday uh, over the weekend hopefully you do your peer networking and some discussion and if at all needed reach out to us otherwise we will see you on Monday uh, at nine o'clock for our concluding discussions. Um, also one small uh, request if possible please let us know by the end of Saturday if you want to have some one-on-one -on -one consulting session with us so that we can schedule the time on Monday. Yeah, yeah exactly so it'll be easier for us so do right. let us know and um, please feel free to contact us in, in uh, for any other issues as well right thank you right. so much yeah right. and when you write perhaps it is better to also uh, indicate what is your issue what would you like to discuss so that if in case we cannot agree on a time for Sunday, then we can at least uh, respond by email. That will be our effort. Yeah. Yeah. But do enjoy your weekend. Also, don't get bogged down with this assignment. Yeah. Weekends are weekends. Yes, Priyanka, is that your new hand? 
Yes, it is my new hand. Sorry, yeah. I just okay. wanted to add, Bharti, if you can also add column on professional backgrounds, because as a conservation architect, I think I'll be more inclined to <laughs> want to partner with non-architects or non-built yes. you know, like, uh, heritage professionals. So maybe that's also a, a way to decide which group you want to be part of because right. I mean, the background of the person. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll try to fit in all the columns as much as possible. Right. That's a good suggestion. And then I believe that uh, state would also allow you to indicate more information if you feel that would be relevant. So please feel free to do that, right? Barbie? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I think uh, that's it for the day. I hope this was helpful. Uh, Yanis, do you have any final things to say? Is Yanis still around? Yeah, Yanis is there. Yanis, any final comments? No, I think it's it's fine. I mean, fine. Okay. I think it's very clear. Right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, just one bit of information. Since the formal workshop will be over, after Monday, um, you will have more access to uh, Barbi, Yanis, and myself. And we can have one or two more colleagues from our center. Uh, and uh, on the need basis, we can also help you reach out to the facilitators. But that is something we cannot guarantee because they will have all their, their work. But uh, but we are will be there to help you as much as possible. Yeah. Thanks, Yanis and Varvi, and thank you all of you for the wonderful interaction today. 